I get to meet quite a lot of people in whiskey and have really fascinating discussions with them. And I quickly appreciate that they know their subjects and their topic in a way that I never will, whether that's kind of the production of whiskey, the maturation of whiskey, the blending of whiskey, whether it's wood management, whether it's knowing their own brand, their own distillery's history, or uh, the way their distillery runs. These people know their subject in a very, very deep way, and it's fascinating. Then I also meet people in whiskey that understand whiskey in a different way. They understand whiskey in a much wider way. And it's the type of people that you can literally not select a specific topic for and discuss literally anything and have fantastic insight and information shared. That is what I'm hoping for tonight. I'm looking forward to it. And I'll see you in a second. Hello, whiskey folk. Hello, everyone. You caught me topping up my dram there. I hope you're all doing very well. Welcome to another Thursday night. Welcome to the V Pub. How are you all doing? I hope you are fantastic. Um, I opened up to give a brief kind of overview of my guest tonight. The topics we're going to uh, talk about we really quite broad, uh, wide-ranging topics. But I have to start tonight. <laughs> Um, talking about the weekend. Uh, it was a London whiskey show at the weekend. And I know that there was a lot of people down there in London and I know the reports back and social media and every, every, everybody had a fantastic, a cracking, cracking time. But of course, the thing I want to talk about uh, uh, on the VPUB is the cracking time that we had last weekend. So I'm sure everyone knows that because of a very specific bar fly, our friend Jimmy Legg, uh, a guy who really never imagined he would ever make it across to Scotland. Finally, after years of colouring up our chat here and getting to know everyone in the lounge, decided that he could make the pilgrimage to Scotland. And we chose a Saturday night in order for Jimmy Legg's visit to be the catalyst for a gathering. It's been a long time since we've had a gathering like that. And for me, it's always been this kind of way to take this lounge that, you know, there's 200 of you in just now. And it's building as you're grabbing your drums and your chairs and you're settling down. But to take that, that virtual chat, that virtual lounge, the, the V and the V pub stands for virtual, of course. But to remind us all that there is nothing virtual about it, that we're all very, very real and sitting in our own corner, wherever we may be in this world. We did that on Saturday night. And I was nervous. I was wondering how it was going. To, it wasn't really structured. There was very little organization on my part, a little bit. It was fabulous. It was beyond fabulous. I was constantly looking to make sure everybody had somebody else to talk to. I was making sure that people were comfortable and they were happy and they had a dram in their hand. And I'd, at no point did I ever find anyone that was unhappy or didn't have somebody to talk to or didn't have a dram in their hand. It was close to perfect. I know that there's going to be chats in the lounge tonight about last Saturday night, and I know that there's going to be people that are much more familiar with each other. But I also know there's a lot of you that couldn't make it. But understand, it was a success, a bigger success than you can imagine. We will do this again. I need to say some thanks for, for Saturday night. Of course, I need to thank everybody at the Bon Accord. I need to thank Thomas for being so accommodating, for being so re relaxed and laid back about it all. We didn't know how many numbers would turn up and we ended up crowding the place out in the beginning. It thinned out as the night went on and we managed to make more space in the Bon Accord. But in the end, we had to get literally thrown out of the place we wanted. We didn't want the night to end, but he laid everything on from, uh, for us and all the staff, all the team at the Bon Accord made it very, very easy too. They were just fantastic. I want to thank everybody that brought a bottle along to donate. I want to thank uh, Ross and Jill Mashburn who gifted me uh, Springbank Local Barley and wouldn't take any money for it. 
So in return, I promised them that that would be the dram that welcomed everybody to the Bonacord on Saturday night. And the team, <laughs> the Bonacord managed to make a 750ml bottle of a uh, Springbank local barley go 70 ways. It was split into 70 drams so that everybody could get a glass put in their hands when they arrived at the Bon Accord. But then the donations just came in beyond that. Scott Monroe donated his Springbank rum cask, a 15-year-old. Fantastic, Scott. Thank you so much. Sevi donated his brand new 15-year-old daft mill so that everybody could get a taste of that. You know, the one that Francis last week said it wasn't that good. I can tell you it's an absolute banger. It's fantastic. Um, Gavin from Gav's Drams in Edinburgh, he brought along his cage bottling and shared it with everybody. He went down an absolute treat. Thank you, Gav. Jimmy Jazz brought his Arden America all the way from America because, of course, it's a bottle that was only released for the American market. So he brought that over for us to taste uh, what the Americans were uh, getting to try from Arden Merkin. Um, Thomas, incredible, still had a, a decent chunk of my Loch Lomond release from last year the 10 year old wine yeast release. It was his dad's bottle and he brought it along to us. Just so emotional. I brought it along, I brought it along to us and he said, Can, uh, I'd, I'd like you to share this. You, and we absolutely did. Some people that never got a chance to taste that last year get to taste it on Saturday night. And it went down an absolute treat. Thomas, thank you so much, buddy. Uh, we also got uh, a wee bit later, Thomas came back up again and said, Roy, I've got that bottle. And I said, no, you've already given me the bottle. And he handed me a bottle of Chichibu, a bottle of Chichibu for everybody to enjoy. Just incredible generosity, incredible. Uh, Thomas and the team at the Bon Accord understand what the community is all about. It was a very, very good night. It was enhanced by everybody that came along with that open mindedness and that generosity. And I really do hope that we get to do it and uh, live another night like that again. Here's to all the barflies that made it. Here's to all the barflies that supported and came along. And here's to all the barflies that couldn't make it this time. I look forward to seeing you at the next gathering. Who's going to step forward for the next fest? Cheers, everyone, and welcome. Incredible scenes. If you want to see photos of everything, of all the things that we got up to, it's all very active there in the Aquaviti Barflies page. Jimmy Legg has already bought us a wee dram. Buddy, it's so good to see you in. I hope you've recovered. I hope you're well rested. And I hope Angie is too. He's about to drop me. Say, I've already booked flights for next year. Don't, <laughs> don't tell anyone. I think we'll keep it quiet next time, Jimmy. Will we? We'll just let you come in kind of, you know, in stealth mode. You know, we'll just do a ninja fest next year. Uh, Jimmy was uh, constantly getting cameras in his face, constantly getting uh, handshakes and hugs and everything. And I know that he enjoyed it. I know he had a fabulous time. But I can imagine that uh, it would have been a wee bit overwhelming. It's quite a strange concept. It's quite different, isn't it? Uh, Jimmy, thank you for your dram buddy and thank you for your uh, just amazing presence uh, last weekend. Uh, I've got a couple of other, other wee items of um, housekeeping before I welcome in my guest tonight, uh, but I'm not going to dwell too long. I'm going to jump into the lounge and welcome some of you beautiful whiskey folk and dedicated bar flies. Whiskey and obviously Jim has seen, I've no idea what I drank on Saturday night, Roy. Eh, I certainly didn't drink anything bad, that much I do know. <laughs> Jim, it was brilliant to see you there. We had so many kind of YouTube folk there, YouTube faces. We had Whiskey Diary Ben, we had Jim Whiskey and Alves, we had Gav's Drams, we had, and I'm going to run out now and start to forget and offend some of my peers and cr peer creators out there on YouTube. But it was amazing, Alan Wilson, the Whiskey Friend. Um, it was amazing just to have that kind of camaraderie there too, that mutual support. Everybody just kind of looking out for each other. It's just perfect. It's not typical in the digital realm, and we need to foster that kind of vibe as for as long as we can. He's in here tonight. I was going to make sure you weren't you weren't working, but you're here tonight, Peter Lee. Saying good evening, all. I've checked in early. Fantastic, buddy. I want to raise a glass and and thank. I mean, just how it's like there there are multiple Denise and Peter Lees, right? If somebody needs a lift from the airport, they're there. If somebody needs uh, moved from A to B. If somebody needs a bottle of something, if somebody needs some help or support or directions or just a welcoming, friendly face, they're there. It's incredible. They are relentless and they embody the Barfly community like nothing you can imagine. So to Peter and Denise, cheers to you too. Ross Brereton, Ross, I got to see you. Annual event, perhaps. Let's not make it annual. Let's make it whenever it's appropriate, right? 
whenever the time is right. Uh, but I am up for that, Ross. Chris Banks Wildlife has seen hello round the bar flies from the wet Isle of Mull. Fantastic. You're out in Mull. Wonderful stuff, Chris. Um, I know it's a wee bit wet, but you know what the West Coast is like. Wait a minute and it'll change. Chris Brown has seen I'll definitely be at the next gathering. Chris, sorry to miss you this time. I'm glad you'll be there for the next one. Just jumped. Chat always jumps. Uh, Pedro is saying, I'll do my best to join you next year. Aquavite would love to share the moments and a couple of drams of all the barflies. You'd be coming from Brazil to do it, Pedro. But you know what? We had a few South Americans in. We had a guy from Peru in. We had a couple of Costa Ricans there. Uh, we had a guy, Eric, came all the way from Sydney, Australia. It was inc incredible. Hell is suggesting a Shela fest. Why not? Why not? Uh, Rob Smith is saying the secret is out. Uh, well, well, the secret might be out, Rob, but he's not going to share what his flight <laughs> arrangements are. He might not even choose to share it with me. Gino is in saying, hello, sir. Good to see you, Gino. Still enjoying yourself in Scotland, you and Graham. I hope you're comfortable and doing well. Uh, fantastic to see all your photos and sharing as you travel around. And uh, Sandro from Italy is saying, sounds amazing, Aquaviti. Well done, Roy and Bonacord. Sounds like an amazing time. We had a kind of impromptu meeting on the Friday night, and we had a night over at Peter's to just kind of wind down and eat some good Chinese food laid on by Peter and Denise. And then Monday, just a few of us managed to go up and get an inside tour of Loch Lomond, which is a very, very rare thing to happen because they don't have a visitor centre. There's no way to, to tour it unless there's some kind of uh, kind of behind the scenes access. And seeing Loch Lomond um, it was, a, for a few of us there, it was quite an emotional thing, to be honest. Those that have loved the whiskey for a long time. Good evening, Ryan, everyone, says Whiskey Wolf. I uh, hope your week has been fine so far. Just got my bottle of Kings Barnes Duca and the new Bell Rock release cast strength to try. We'll be joining. Uh, what, what will you be sipping on? Well, I'm actually sipping on theme tonight. I've got a product that was bottled by my guest, but it was bottled many years ago. In fact, I think this was bottled way back in 2017, maybe 2018. Uh, one of the last bottles, actually. Talk about that a wee bit later. Frank and I are planning a, a bell fest. <laughs> we'll get you all here yet, says Whiskey Novice. Aye, we trip to Northern Ireland. That could be a laugh as well, couldn't it? Heartwarming photos, says Sheila. I'll be there next year, Jimmy. Fantastic, Sheila. Thank you very much for your dram. Saxo Scott has just joined Aquavite Barflies. Thank you, Eric. Thank you very much for your support. And a, a dram has also come in from... Uh, Brian Stormont is, is celebrating being a member for eight months of the Barflies. And James DeGiulio has bought me a dram to say, sorry, I missed the V-Pub last week. I was travelling. I know you were travelling. You were here, uh, James. And that's the thing about the V-Pub. It's, it's here for when you need it. It's here for when you want it. And you can pick it up on the replay and you, there's no requirement ever for attendance. And False Graph is saying, good evening, Roy. Good to hear Legfest was good. Also good to watch you as always looking forward to another interesting guest today. You know it, Klaus. I know that you know David Sturk and you'll be uh, curious to see what the chat's going to be tonight. Herbin is saying, that's a great idea for a new fest. <laughs> Bud Jenkins is saying, I received my bottles of your new release yesterday, Aquavite. Maybe the first to hit the West Coast of the USA. Yeah, it's amazing how, how fast they're getting to the far reach, reaches of the world. I think it looks like they're out of stock now, but I think Royal Mile whiskies have kept maybe a larger buffer than they normally would just because of how far these bottles are travelling and they're a wee bit nervous about breakages and they want to make sure that everybody gets their bottles intact. Um, so that being that, um, I think that whatever stock is left remaining at some point, it's going to be uh, released if there are any, indeed any left. Thank you all for your support on that one too. And Erin is saying, the last two barflies, sorry, the two barflies release arrived yesterday along with McLean's Nose and a few others. Erwin, I saw your post on the barflies uh, Facebook page, so it's made it all the way to you as well, buddy. I hope you enjoy them. Jimmy, like I say, the Halyard Battalion were the funniest men of the week. Tony 12 coats, is that right? <laughs> Says Jimmy, where's, where's the novice? The Halyard Battalion always bring beautiful colours. Uh, to the gatherings in Glasgow. I'm looking forward to welcoming them all in November. Thank you, everybody. Cheers. The people that are signing up for the Barflies and Hel Hel Helen Widdison celebrating being a member for 42 months. I know I say this all the time, but it's important that you understand that what the Barfly membership does, 199 of whatever your currency is to join, and it keeps the VPUBs ad-free. There are no ads to sit and watch a VPUB or any of the content on the Aquavite channel. Thank you all for your support. My funding is through Patreon. That's how I can buy whiskies. That's how I can travel. That's how I can make whiskey my career, which is a wonderfully privileged thing to be able to say to you in 2023. Eric Cunliffe is down in Campbelltown right now. It's a treat to be uh, watching live 
in Campbelltown. Renee and I have had uh, extra fun at the Cadenheads Warehouse tasting. I know you're having a blast down there, Eric, and thank you uh, for giving me a wee shout to say that you were in the shop, buddy. Do you know, celebrating being a member for 42 months as well, what a pleasure it was to meet all of you. It was a pleasure to meet you too, Gino. Uh, I'm not going to talk about it anymore because at some points there I was getting a wee bit emotional about it all, and I, I think that the people that were there would understand why, you know, it was just the type of thing that makes you look at the human condition and say, oh, you know what, we'll be all right. <laughs> we're good people, we're good people. Um, there's something happening this weekend, and I've missed it before, but I have missed this event only because I could not travel there, and that's the Bastards Ball in Texas. That's the annual Whiskey Tribe, a Whiskey Vault event hosted by Daniel Rex and the team over there in Austin. And I normally would just be there. But of course, after what I've just relayed to you, what happened last weekend and the things I've got coming up in the weeks ahead, it wasn't just a time constraint. It was a finance constraint. It was everything. It wasn't reasonable to do it this year. A shout out to everybody out there in Texas that travel from all over to get to Austin every year. And it's a super fabulous weekend for me to meet and greet all of you too and participate and enjoy the community that they've built over there at their channels. It's the biggest community in whiskey. There's over a million subscribers over the two channels right now and what they put together every year is just the best fun. I'm going to be super sad watching what's happening over in Texas this weekend and I'm really really sad to miss it. I hope you have a blast all of you. Of course, we are now in the phase two of Oswiz. It's out there. It's, it's, it's out there for public vote. Ralphie has just put out a video, a video to encourage everybody to and remind everybody that it's there and to step forward. And I think that it's right to do that. And I have to do something too to kind of reach, make sure I reach all of my community and remind them that the more the Scotch whiskey community specifically is engaged in this thing. We don't want everyone, you know, don't go out to every subreddit that you're involved in, every Facebook group and everything. And remember, this is supposed to be celebrating the Scotch whiskey community specifically. It's the online Scotch whiskey awards. So it's our perspective of what we're enjoying and what we love. So if you're in a Facebook group that that's appropriate, if you're in a subreddit, if you're in a whiskey club, if you're in an event, anything, Mention the Online Scotch Whiskey Awards and talk to people and let them know that the reason it works is because it's collaborative and it's open, it's democratic, and it's meant to be as inclusive as possible. At oswa.co.uk, oswa.co.uk, you can get voting now and it's open until the 22nd. Don't put it off until the 21st. Vote now and then go back any time between now and the 21st to 22nd, as long as that poll remains open, you can change your mind, you can edit your vote. So as you're trying the whiskies that the nominations have offered you, and you decide that you want to change your mind about your vote, you can do that. More to follow on the Online Scotch Whiskey Awards. On the 4th of November, Ralph and I will get together and announce the winners once more like we did the last two years. I'm looking forward to seeing what happens there. Thank you for your support. Finally, the only thing left to say is that I'm a wee bit dry. My Ardmorkin bottles, cask 411 and 413, both bottles are now installed behind the bar at the Bon Accord, at the pot still in Glasgow, and if you're through in Edinburgh, at the Ensign York too. Anybody that's interested in getting a, if you're a bar owner or something out there and you're interested in getting your hands on a bottles, contact Drinkmonger, contact the Royal Mail Whiskies, contact Arthur Motley, and, and do that if you if you like. He may be able to sort you out before all the bottles uh, disappear. But that's a fantastic thing to do because then the people that weren't able to buy the bottles, they can at least try a wee dram. And maybe if they're in the mood, try the two uh, casks next to each other. It's picked specifically to celebrate whatever the previous incumbent might have been in a refill Scotch whiskey cask. Every other aspect is the same. The fill date, the maturation location, the age, the bottling strength, the, everything is identical. The only thing that differentiates them is each of the Exadelphi refill hogsheads both had a different previous incumbent. How different? Well, just have a look at the colour. 
and that's before you've ever even put your nose over the glass. Gene Kelly saying the Oz was at a highlight of the year, the perfect kickoff to the holidays. Thank you, Gene. That's really kind words, and I know that a lot of people are excited about it. Spread the word for me, Gene, and thank you. Peter Lee's bought me a dram. Can I give a special mention to Denise Lee, Denise Lee, the princess of the butterfly? She put up with my mood swings throughout the week. Denise has helped me so much. She's helped us all so much, Peter. I hope I made mention of Denise earlier when I was talking about you two. I'm pretty sure I did say both of you quite a few times. Uh, she's a superstar. Um, I I wish I could give her a wee hug right now, my friend. Thank you for the dram. Cheers. What you have both done uh, in order to help the weekend go smoothly uh, can't be easily overstated. We're spreading a good word about you. Says Hellswood, Dramface and the Oz was today at Brook Laddie. <laughs> thank you, my ambassadors over there on Isla Helen. Thank you so much. Whiskey Weekend Drama saying, glad I could share it here in the Netherlands. Fantastic, Harold. Terrific stuff. Thank you for your sharing of the bottles. Okay, uh, over 300 of you, and I know you're, uh, you're getting tired of listening to me, and I'm 20 minutes in now. My guest sitting in the background patiently waiting. Thank you. This guest... I had the privilege to, well, I've met, I've bumped into him kind of over the table at various events or things like that. And I've kind of been vaguely aware of being in the same space as him. But uh, it, there was a good occasion uh, in Limburg this year for us to travel together from the airport uh, to the festival and then meet at the airport ever so briefly on the way back again. And I figured out quite quickly that David would be a great, great guest. Uh, I think he gave me a business card that I've since misplaced. doesn't matter in these days of social media and things, it's easy to get in touch. And I reached out to him and I said, hey, do you know what the VPUB is? Yep, for coming along. And yes, no problem. So then it was a case of getting our heads together to work out what we could talk about. What's our theme? What's our topic? And the more I spoke to him, the more this concept of an independent mindset came across. This, this idea of not being attached to any specific brand or having loyalty in any specific direction, just being super passionate and super engaged and super knowledgeable about whiskey. He's near three decades into whiskey now. And I think it's a privilege to be in that position where people feel confident to step forward and share their story. I'm looking forward to sharing a few stories, hopefully, with my guest tonight, just as Graham Fraser buys a wee dram to say, good to see so many bar flies over the long weekend. And it was good to have you there too, Graham. Thank you for your support as always. Cheers, buddy. I'm going to need to pour another dram as a welcome in my friend, David. David Stark, everybody. Bring you in. Hello, my friend. Hello. How are you doing? I'm good, thank you. Good, good. Nice to be able to hear you nice and clearly too. Hey, welcome behind the bar at the V-Pub. Thank you very much for stepping forward. Hey, El, congratulations on your smart t-shirt too. I've got one of those. <laughs> did you pick it up at the distillery or did you get it? Uh, uh, the whiskey show. Ah, you got it at the whiskey show. Superb, superb. Yeah. Um, of course, the entire team was down there. I saw Connell, I saw Alex yeah, down there too, and, um, and they had a, a decent lineup of stuff. Fantastic start to things. Thank you for stepping forward, David. I'm going to start tonight, as I usually do, with a wee, uh, with a wee anecdote. I was at, and it would have been the early days of the Glasgow Whiskey Club, so maybe for the Glasgow Whiskey Club for me, maybe 2017, something like that. And I was sitting chatting to somebody, and I, and I said, uh, I was astounded. It was a Glen Grant, a, a, a very mature Glen Grant I was sipping it was from one of your exclusive bottlings, I think. And I was astounded at the quality of the whiskey. And I was astounded that such quality could be at such a price. And I said, I have become a solid fan of the Creative Whiskey Company. I promise you this is not the discussion for tonight, but I'm going to talk about this. And... He raised a glass and we, we just said, yeah, it's fantastic. And he told me, they've sold the company. It's it's no longer in existence. I was like, what? I've literally just declared my my, my love for a specific brand, for a specific independent bottler. And just like that, they disappear. Such is the nature of things. I'm not going to talk about that with you tonight, David, if you don't mind, unless you bring it up, it's, you're more than welcome to. But it's in your book. You, you've dedicated the, the guts of a chapter to that, to telling everybody how that came about um, and how the Creative Whiskey Company was created in the first instance. Instead tonight, I'm going to harness and try and tap into all of the little whiskey casks that are rolling about in David Stuck's head and try and tie down a few and tap into them, sample them a little bit and see what they deliver, if you're okay with that. 
Sound okay? It's who I can remember. <laughs> I think you'll remember fine. The first thing I'm going to ask you is that really glib thing that I tend to ask guests just to get things started. And, you know, do you like whiskey? <laughs> like is just far too inferior a word, isn't it? it uh, I think I've been asked that about every five months, six months since I joined the industry. The accent doesn't help, of course. But, yes, um, yes. Everywhere I go, you know, I say, what do you do? Blah, blah, blah. Do you actually like whiskey? Yes. <laughs> and, and yeah, I fell in love with whiskey, poof, 96. Um, so, yeah, and that's all I ever wanted to do was, was whiskey. And, um, yeah. I had a little period where I fell out, but um, probably six months. But other than that, it's been my longest love affair. Even a little even bit of a, a little bit of a reset, a little bit of absence. Yeah, yeah. Wonder, right. Well, I mean, you you mentioned '96 there. Uh, you know, I've, I've, you're coming on and, and close to th completing three decades. Um, I, I I do want to ask you about about your origin story, how that came about, because I've got the feeling that you and I. We, the only thing that we maybe have in common is that we've both invited ourselves in, <laughs> right? We just, yeah. yeah. Um, I don't know, but how did it start? How did it come about? Was it was it a job first or was it a glass first? It was a glass first. It was, yeah. I, I mean, I, I talk about it in the book, but um, it, whiskey, until I had a Glenlivet 21 thrust into my hand, whiskey was an awful drink. And, and I mentioned in the book, the, 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 jo the generation that I grew up in, if you had a party and somebody brought a bottle of whiskey without a mixer, everybody would look at that person with, with deep suspicion. This yes. guy's wrong. And some, something bad is going to happen <laughs> with this guy. Uh, and <clears throat> when, I, when I turned 20, somebody gave me a Glenlivet 21 and it blew every preconception I had. Uh, completely out of the window it just shocked my senses as to how good whiskey could be um and that was it really that that one dram uh and and i suppose a couple of friends enthusiasm for malt whiskey that was just beginning to percolate the six classics were were not long out and things like that yeah. um but yeah that was it that one dram it was you know the heavens opened and 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 god came out and said arthur and and uh, I, I went off <laughs> looking for the holy grail <laughs> And so that would have been the early nineties, just to put, just to place it. When would that have been? Nineteen ninety-six, September nineteen ninety-six. Yeah. So that the glass of whiskey was nineteen ninety-six. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it's quite a vivid thing. Yeah. I, I get it. I understand it completely. I can. I can. I know the exact specific date of mine too. And it's just so that 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 idea that whiskey's found you. Yeah. So I, I, before I, I've got some statements, prov provocative statements, some of them but all fairly mild. I think they're just prompts for us to talk about this concept of independence, independent thinking, independent companies, independent brands, all of that stuff. And then to kind of bring it around towards the end to talk about what, what the future holds and how uh, adaptability to re may remain key. But in order to get there, can we have, before we go through the prompts, can we have a kind of chronological executive summary of your career to date? There are lots of people that are going to have this book in their hand. They're going to know who you are, David. They maybe have your Campbelltown book in their hand. They maybe know that you're the, the guy behind the Creative Whiskey Company and various other projects, consultancy projects, whatever it may be. But for the folk that don't know who David Sturk is, um, just if you could give us two minutes, start, maybe start back. And I think your first job was Whiskey Magazine. Would that be right? Yeah, it was. Yeah. Uh, I mean, b before that, I, I traveled Isla for... Uh, I traveled Scotland for a week for charity doing as many distilleries as I could. And we did 88 distilleries in five days, which is probably still a record. Um, and from that, I was invited to do tastings at the second uh, Speyside Whiskey Festival. It wasn't even called the Spirit of Speyside Whiskey Festival. It was just called the Speyside Whiskey Festival. There I met the publisher of Whiskey Magazine uh, who invited me down for a job interview. This is my final year of university. Got a job with them. I was with them for about a year and a half, um, was asked by a, a publisher to write um, what became the Malt Whiskey Guide, which is actually my first book. Uh, that was a very short-lived um, project. Uh, from that, I then joined Cadenheads, which I talk about in the book, which was just the most incredible bit of serendipity ever. Um, wow. Yep. Worked with Cadenheads. I went down to Campbelltown, lived there for two and a half years, 
uh, due to geographical reasons, I left and joined Douglas Lang for about four months and then left them. And in January 2005, I started Creative Whiskey. And uh, in 2018, sold that company, had a two year period of business purgatory. But within that time, um, set up a consultancy firm, which was allowed and helped uh, my closest company, which is Claxton's. Gave a little bit of help to Little Brown Dog, Watt Whiskey, did some work with North Star Spirits. Um, and I've helped other companies like Single Cast Nation, Svensk Elvatten, um, and probably a few other bottlers I've forgotten. Uh, and then sure. up to present day, um, obviously written, uh, I wrote the Distilleries of Campbelltown when I was in Campbelltown. Yep. And the, the independent Scotch book came out in February this year. And on the 20th of October, I will open a shop in the village where I live. So, um yeah. Relentless. Uh, Relentless. Yeah, well, it sounds it. I, I, I think I'm a very lazy person, but uh, <laughs> and, and that is nearly three decades as well. But um, yeah, well, in, in between a lot of drams and a lot of um, mishaps and headaches. and Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think that that comes across when I speak to you. So that, that was thank you for a punchy executive summary. I think what, what you do, though, is when we when you speak to people, is that you betray that experience. You betray that you've been able to look behind quite a lot of curtains over the years and see a lot of things and understand a lot of concepts that a lot of people, eh, it's not that they're not capable or interested or anything, it's just that their their trajectory doesn't put them in a position to do so, whereas yours has. Yeah, yeah. And I, your ability to then I kind mean, of... Was, my timing's been incredible, Roy. It's, uh, looking back, you, you, at the time, you don't realise it. It's only when you look back. Even even yourself, you, you think, you know, when you first started, you did timing is come too late come too early um yeah timing is 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 so is everything uh, yeah. so lucky now well it's interesting you talk about you think you're quite a lazy person too i sometimes have the same feeling myself i'm not doing enough i'm not doing enough and then you work out how many hours you're doing and you realize that's, that's that's a feeling it's not a reality um and it's it's also you know if you're achieving and if you're making things work there's a good chance that you're not being lazy it's just a sensation of feeling right and you know i think i said last week when francis was on um it was i think it was jack nicholas but i need to check it out said a lot of people say oh you're very lucky aren't you and he said yes i'm very lucky but i find the harder i work the luckier i become right yeah, yeah. um and so and but you, you all of that is is true and fine but you hit the nail right in the head timing is everything timing opportunity they're, just, they're, they're a supreme example actually they yeah you, you know they were no no one could see that curveball coming um you know we uh, we talked about this before but even people have to remember when aaron was built you know when harold curry built aaron in 1994 he envisioned that as a supplier to the blend market and i think people forget that he didn't have the foresight of um, Aaron becoming one of the most revered malt whiskies on the market. Yep. He really believed 80 to 90% of everything they would do would go to the blending world. Because and that and, yeah. the way it was. So, yeah, it, it uh, for for the Cuthbert's to come along and do Daphne Mill when they did, I mean, you look back now and say, oh, you're lucky. Well, people at the time were calling them crazy. So, you know, uh, it, it, as you say, it's... It, uh, they're, they're, they're not lucky because of lack of work there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yes, anyway. exactly. And and I think I think it's wonderful to see Aaron now. It's wonderful. And I remember the first time I was presented with an Aaron bottling. I thought, why would I Why would I touch a new distillery? Whereas now I've got the new Harris, just as soon as it's out the wrapper, you know, oh, come on, let's. It's just, it's this, this kind of eagerness to try all of these new things. And I think you and I are going to touch upon a lot of those things tonight, a lot of those motivations, a lot of those things that have completely changed in whiskey, even in the short tenure that you've had from 96 until today. Incredible scenes, incredible uh, shift in the landscape to witness, right? And we're gonna put up the first of our wee prompt here, just to establish your opinion on something. The folk that are in here tonight, they know my take on this, but I'm gonna ask David Scar. I'm gonna suggest whiskey, David, is the world's best spirit. Yeah, it's. Uh, I mean, if you look at my shelves, um, it'd be very hard to argue with that. Uh, when I joined Cadenheads in two thousand and one, and until and before I joined them, I'd never had a single cast rum. I didn't know single cast rum existed. I didn't know aged rum existed. To me, rum was Bacardi, and at that yeah. time, 
from 2001 till 2004 or whatever it was, 2002, 2004, everyone was saying, our oh, rum's the next big thing. Rum's the next big thing. And of course it, it wasn't. And then tequila was going to be the next big thing. And mezcal is going to be the next big thing. And cognac and brandy. And, you know, I've got 20 odd years of hearing this over and over and over. And they none of them have made any dent in the growth expansion uh, and, and fevered, um, you know, joy and, and apprehension for scotch. None of them yep. have. There are yep. no cues outside any cognac producer when they come out with a new bottle that I know of. But yeah. I mean, the little town I lived in and wrote a book in now has cues every time that distillery releases. On a Tuesday morning, there is a queue. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, uh -huh. And, and Glen Scotia now sells to that town. And they're now getting two, three, four, you know. So, yeah, I, whiskey yeah. is the world's best spirit. Definitely. Yeah. Um, what do, you, what, what, what do you what do you what do you think? Sorry, I, I've just. I was going to say just the sheer um, the the way the world's embraced it. I mean, I, you try and find a country that doesn't make whiskey now, and yet, yeah. you know, rum is still only made in a bunch of countries. Um, yep. But yeah, whiskey's made everywhere, absolutely everywhere. So has no, to I want to, I want to be clear there that the statement I made, I didn't specifically say Scotch whiskey, but I'm talking about whiskey generally, and that's. It's a real dynamic today where every country is making whiskey. What, what do you think it is? What, what is it that drives us? I, surely it's the flavor chase. Yeah, it, yeah, yeah, it is. It's, um, I think all whiskey drinkers, assuming they're not one of those uh, annoying single brand people, I only drink insert X, and apologies if I just did a slightly American accent there. Um, I am half American, so I'm allowed to say these things. <laughs> but if you're not one of those people who says I only drink, um, you are, as you've just said, with the new releases, there's something in your brain that says that's a different flavor. That's something I've got to try. I have to try that. And every new release and every time somebody recommends something to you and we're all in a pursuit of a little nuance, a little subtlety, something that will uh, deliver an extra dimension to the next dram you have and the next dram you have and of course no two are ever the same right um, and that's what it is it's it's a continual uh pursuit of these flavors and what just when you think you've 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 had enough the whiskey show this weekend somebody and i wish i could remember somebody gave me a, a whiskey that had um the fin you know the scandinavian turkey the scandinavian licorice sweets it had that okay in. Yeah, yeah. It was the first time I've ever had that in a in a whiskey. Um, so yeah, you just keep finding things, and it and it and it keeps expanding you and 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 your senses and when your expectations. So I think that's what it is. We're assuming that we're not zo so zoned into one uh, brand. Which yeah, I the way the way it used to be. I mean, the, the whiskey industry has been built on the concept of being in one brand. I was a Bell's or a Grouseman or a Black and White or whatever it was. Finish a bottle, replace a bottle. What you've just summed up there is something that really we have to accept. It's an endless pursuit. It's never going to be completed. You know, you catch them all is never going to be a thing. So it drives ridiculous promiscuity. Mm. This is new, right? This is a new concept. This, Definitely. I mean. Yeah. It's almost like yeah. maybe wine, I don't know, but even then people had their favourite vineyards they just bought from the same vineyard. Whiskey, we are very promiscuous. And this is what's changed the industry. As you've yeah. just said, the industry was bred on, I'm a Hague guy, I'm a Buchanan's guy, I'm a teacher's guy, whatever it was. When we think of a certain generation, when we think of our parents, grandparents, whatever, as whiskey drinkers, he always had a bottle of insert brand in the cupboard, always. And, and living yeah. like I do in rural parts of Scotland, we still have that. We have the guys who I'll chat to and say, well, I, I only drink grouse. That's all I drink. And yeah. I, in my head, I'm thinking, well, you know what? You're not actually a whiskey drinker. You're a guy that has something that he relies on on a Friday night. But you're not a whiskey drinker. Uh, and and, if, and they, if, they want, if they want to re refer to themselves as a whiskey drink, drinker, I suppose that's fine. But... but the the whiskey the explorer i think it's i think it's a mindset david yeah you know all the people that i hung out with this weekend all the people that you hung out with this weekend you're all getting on like a family right the best of friends i think there's an open-mindedness to be yeah. beyond that buchanan's guy that beyond that Hague guy 
and that open mindedness carries with your personality into the whiskey space where you enjoy and share the whiskey yeah. too. You said it right. It's not. It's not that they're not a whiskey drinker. You, you're quite right. It's not. They're not an explorer. Yeah. And, and and we all know those people who will only eat certain foods, and they're the same. It's not like they don't eat, but they don't have enjoyment in the Exploring. challenge, new things, and everything. And uh, and and as I said, the, the the sweeping change of the industry from the late '80s and the '90s. Um, into in and what's driven everything that probably we'll talk about is the fact that the next generation came in and said, "I'm actually not a Hague drinker. I'm a whiskey explorer, and that's a yeah. better term. I like that. I'm I'm an yeah. explorer, and I'll and I'll try it. But I actually I like the fact that Hague tasted different in the fifties, and the yeah. you know, da, 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 and what goes into Hague uh, and things like that. So uh, no, that, that's it, right. And and, and we love we we. Uh, it's not to Buchanan's Hague White Mackay. Uh, we love exploring them and, and and especially exploring antique representations from the past to see what our parents and our grandparents and things like that were enjoying at the time. Um, and it's wonderful. It's a privilege. But despite the despite the critiques and the, 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 the complaints and the moans that I may have tonight, David, I apologize. I have still love enjoying whiskey in 2023. Despite everything, it's it, it's it's different days. I know you've just completed a book, um, uh, and and I want I know that, that you're not here to plug your book tonight. Your your book's long out now, but it's still available for sale. I want to plug it because I think some people would look at the cover of that book, David, and think, well, only ten percent of my bottles are from Indies, or only a proportion. I don't know. Do I really? This is you're misleading us with this title. Yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> you're, this is. This is very focused on independent scotch and the effect that independent scotch had on the whiskey landscape. But if we go back to Andrew Usher and Johnny Walker and the, and the wee grocers and things like that, what we're actually talking about is in, independent bottlers. Yeah. What what you've actually done here in a way that I've read this book twice and I, all I wish is that I had the brain that could retain the wonder that's in here. This is your brain that's in this book because I've read it twice and the second time round I was still surprising myself, right? But you've got this kind of crisscross of kind of personal stories in one chapter and then kind of more kind of uh, whiskey and whiskey history and whiskey development focus in another chapter, very much ro revolving around independent bottlings and independent bottlers and the rise of the independent bottler and the effect that it had. However, what you've actually done, which is incidental and probably not designed, is another wonderful testimony to the history of whiskey, all of whiskey, all the dynamics, everything it feeds into it. And then you realize just how core independent bottling has been to all of that. And I plug the book for that reason. Don't think that you're just reading a book on independent bottlers, you're not. You're reading a book that's full, packed full of nuggets. And can I say, you're professional and you're diplomatic throughout the book, but you're also direct. You speak very directly. And the tone of the book at the start, I said this, I admitted this to you. I was at the start, I was like, where's this going? And then as you go through the book, you say, oh, no, this is right. There's nothing like this happened before. I was glad to be in early. I was glad to get this book. And I'm I'm, I'm going to hit, hit it a third time. I was, However, at the beginning of the book, I was, I was trying to convey a message of, because um, when I first started, it was very stuffy. And the, the opening bit is the opening quote from somebody who is incredibly well known is you'll never be to me. This was a quote to me. You'll never be an expert on whiskey. And what that person was telling me effectively was I'm the Billy big guy here for want of a better word. And you're you're a nobody and you'll never be the Billy big guy. And what this person misunderstood was I didn't want to be the Billy big guy. I wasn't there for any other reason than I truly loved the product and the people in it. And, and those two, it's very important. Those two go hand in hand. So I tried in the beginning to, to convey that message of when you embark on the whiskey journey, the, the, the whiskey exploration um, or the odyssey, as I think I say in the book, it's a personal one and no expert can ever correctly guide you one way or the other now you'll get people who are so educated and have tasted so many things that they can branch you out in different directions but they still can't tell you what you like um and so everyone's an expert 
and that's maybe one of the reasons why I love whiskey so much. And also that there are no rules. There's no yeah. rules with whiskey. And this isn't the wine world. Again, I, it's a nudge, nudge, wink, wink in the book. So I tried in the first chapter. And maybe that became that maybe came across a bit sort of, um, I don't know, uh, high and mighty. But uh, no, it was it was actually the obvious, the, the opposite. <laughs> you were trying I'm very to reluctant to establish establish it about the me. No, as I think well, you so you set out you start the book by trying to state what you are not. You know. So I'm, I, I don't want to be, I don't, don't want to be this, that, and the next thing. And I think what I worked out is I was a couple of chapters in is that you have seen all the characters that exist in whiskey and you've probably learned that you can learn something from every one of them. And there is no single, there cannot ever be a single expert on whiskey. There can be experts that know topics and subjects and specialities very deeply. And there are people that kind of sit from a, a wee bit of a distance and see things very broadly, and then there's every gradient in between. Yeah. And I think that the only expertise that exists in whiskey is a pool of collaborative expertise. As a community, we get together and we're much more potent and powerful. I think we might get to that as the chat goes on. Yeah. Um, so I'll, I'm not going to dwell on the topics you cover in this amazing book, but I will ask one thing, and, and indulge me on this. We'll skip past it quite quickly because I know that you're probably going to be dragged from pillar to post on this topic, down to probably it's been exacerbated by a very important announcement recently by Gordon and McPhail. But I, I would I can't have David Stark on the VPUB and not ask a question or suggest independent bottling. It's the end, or it's the beginning of the end now in 2023 for independent bottlers. Gordon and McPhail have said that, you know, they'll run out their stocks, but they're not going to source any more fillings and they will focus instead on their distilling operations at the Cairn and at Ben Romack. So it's the end, David, isn't it? It's all over. Independent bottling's finished. Well, it, what was it Churchill said? This is this is not the uh, the end, no, not even the beginning of the end, but maybe the end of the beginning. <clears throat> um, it, uh, it's it's incredible, and I, and, and I, I kind of wish, I'm, in a way, I wish I'd knew, known about that before I'd written a book, because I would have changed parts of the book, but in another way, it's good for me because it was such a bombshell annou announcement and outcome yes. the history of independent bottlers. And I made it clear that their story isn't in the book. Yes. And it's funny, a few people, I was at the whiskey show at the weekend and a few people asked me why I was so um, open about them not being in and why I made a big point about it. There, there's a few reasons being that they're, they're the, the oldest, they're not the oldest, they're the biggest and they have a unique or at least in the last two to three decades, had a unique arrangement. And yes. they're also the most secretive. You know, you put them up there with Diageo and they're the two most secretive com companies in the entire industry. They're an absolute closed book. Now, I don't mean to be rude about them in that sense because they're everyone you meet who works with them are wonderful people. It's a wonderful company doing wonderful things. But don't try and ever get a scoop out of Gordon McPhail because they're a closed-knit community. The decision for them to cease, did it send shockwaves through the industry? I don't think so, really, because um, I think the writing was on the wall, to be to be frank. I think the this this generational hand-me-down of um, of interpersonal arrangements, you know, there's no contracts for these fill-ins. Um, yeah. That was always going to end at some point. If 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 supply if demand caught up with supply, why would you sell it to a competitor? Why would you have these labels competing with yourself? And also, <laughs> if you're supplying this biggest independent bottler, on the one hand and on the other for decades, and I'm not going to win. This is not a, a name in name, you know, uh, podcast. Sure, sure. If you're Supplying one on one hand, on the other, you're openly saying we never support independent bottlers. Whilst this company is getting new fillings every year of whiskey from this company, I think eventually somebody in the marketing department will have stood up and said, you know, we're doing this, don't you? You know, we're selling tanker loads of this spirit to this company who are an independent bottler. But we're also telling the world we don't support independent bottlers. There's an absolute conflict of interest there. And I got a bit... Um, pulled apart for calling it I, I wrote a post up when when it was announced and I said it was an unfair advantage and I said I know in the world and business world the word unfair is ridiculous it's what children use in the playground but at the same time it was unfair and it was hypocritical 
And I think maybe when, when, as I said, when demand caught up with supply, that hypocrisy, well, that's quite easy to just correct that. Does it mean it's the end for indie, indie bottlers? The, the, the short term answer is no. There is enough stock. There are enough people doing good things. And there are conversations happening now that didn't happen when I was bottling that will, I think, allow a certain level of independence of independent bottlers to, to keep going, to carrying on. Um, so whilst we may lose the biggest player, um, some of the smaller players may flourish. And that's maybe a little model of how the industry has been for a while anyway, for 100, 150 years. Yeah. If, if I was Gordon McPhail, it probably would have been an easy decision. Supply was getting thin. Companies were threatening to cut off supply or did cut off supply. You've got you've got Ben Romack, one of the greatest whiskey distilleries in the world, and you've just built uh, the Cairn, I think it's called. Yes, yep. A phenomenal distillery. Well, you're going in new directions already, you know, so um, not, not a big problem. And you've got stock for who knows? Who knows how much stock they've got? Who knows how many years? <laughs> yeah, and, and yeah. a lot they, at the point that they made the decision, a lot of the stock they are sitting on is months old. Yeah. So we're not speaking about okay, they're set, their fifteen year olds will be sold as a twenty five and a forty year old. We're talking about there is no immediate impact that we can see. So there was I remember some chat about people thinking about running out to pick up the Connoisseur's Choice and Discovery series and the, <laughs> sorry, calm down. Yeah. Everything's going to be fine. There's going to be there's going to be plenty. And, and I think that, that that's kind of, when we already see the prices going up, when we already see uh, brands maybe disappearing or not as many familiar brands on the shelf, I'm talking about independent bottlers here, when we see that and then we, an announcement comes along, like G&M's announcement, to the, to the lay person or to the, to the more relaxed kind of less... Uh, <laughs> Uh, obsessed whiskey botherer um, than I am, they would maybe look at that and think, "Oh, th genuinely, this this could this could be the end." Do you think that the departure of GNM? Do you think that the departure of some of the kind of bigger producers, the ones that are much more focused on kind of moving up market and moving to mass market, that kind of thing? Do you think there's a vacuum being left there that that kind of gives? I mean, I, I, there's no doubt to me that the space is there. My, my concern about the, the, the end being a bit near is maybe how what stock's going to fill that space? Mm. Where's it going to come from? Well, I think the industry's been filling that space itself. Um, if you think, if you go back to when GNM, the last repackaging of GNM, the, the number of malt whiskies coming out as OB bottlings, let's say there were a thousand a year, within the space of GNM repackaging to now, that might be a five-fold figure. So that that difference, if you're a if you're an old Pulteney fan, for instance, you're a Balblair yeah. fan, fan, or you're a Deanston fan, or whatever, whatever Gordon McFell were bottling. Whereas maybe you could only get a 1997 from Gordon McPhail. Well, if you go to the Deanston warehouse now, you can get 12 different expressions. Yes. That has only happened in the last five years, five to 10 years, five years, really. So they've been filling that void themselves. And that, that's almost certainly part of the reason why supply was cut. It's like, well, hang on a minute. We're struggling to keep up with our own demand or whatever. We don't need to sell to these guys. And it also within that time, you've gone from, let's say, 40 or 50 independent bottlers to hundreds. Yeah. So the, the choice has never been more. G, if if GNM disappeared today as an independent bottler, we would still be exponentially richer in the industry as choice, as far as choice goes. Than than ever before. Any time in the past. Yeah. yeah Any time. Yeah. And and it's it's interesting that they. they who knows what they're going to do with their stocks, but they weren't at the whiskey show this weekend. They weren't there oh. with any, uh, they had Ben Romack. That was it. No Gordon McFell bottlings at all. So that, I think that was a conscientious decision to say to everybody, we are no longer about this. And if you go to the Cairn distillery, um, you can only buy blended whiskey there. That's all they have. They don't even have Ben Romack. So it's, it's like a standalone entity. Um, 
and it's funny when I went there, I, there's not not even a mention of really Gordon McPhail. I was expecting Gordon McPhail. Yeah, you know, yeah. We're so proud. Here's our name. No, you can't find it. So whether they're going to even bottle much going forward, who knows? It's up to them. They can do what they want. They could sell stock back. They could probably fund another distillery selling all their stock back to the distillers. Who knows? But yeah. uh, um, I don't think their loss will cause will cause much problems other than those company have spent the last 20, 30 years building up their name within their markets for everybody else. There's enough supply out there of other things. Okay. Fantastic. It's as uh, Peter Hunt just said, Mr. Stark has just been fabulous. I couldn't hear in describing the Andy Butler and GNM situation and a great book he's done too. Thank you, Peter. And whiskey weekend drum Harrow is saying bad news for Van Wees in the Netherlands. Is that one in your book, David? Yes, Van Wees. They also yeah, Van Wees is in there, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. they're included in the book, Harold. Yeah, although um, they, were, they were written up by uh, by a Dutch guy. So uh, I, I got um, Tace to write up a few companies for me. He knew he knows Van Wees like the back of his hand, so he did that in a heartbeat. So. Yeah, and I always pronounce his name wrong, but Tace, 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 Tace Claverstein, yeah. Tace. I, I, I have don't get it wrong. Him. He's like six foot six. Don't get it wrong. <laughs> yeah, don't make him hit. He's such a nice guy. He was a, he uh, he's, was a, he's also he's also the guy behind Words of Whiskey on the web as well. Uh, an excellent website, an excellent resource. He's a good guy. Um, yeah, I mean, I think I think it's it's almost nice the way that you finished that off and you brought it up to that point. You're talking about uh, the GM scenario, and you said that they're not the oldest, but I think that GM were probably the widest when it comes to being established. They were the the, the the most the most the more well known than Cadden Heads, more well known than Signatory. They were yeah. they were more widespread. And before I came into whiskey, Gordon McPhail was the only independent bottler that I recognized as a brand before I knew yeah. what whiskey was about. So that they're, they're there has the to be something too. They're the absolute godfather because um and this was kind of a revelation to me. When when we we hear of all these sort of big names, your Samarolis, your high moon, your your intertrade, all these guys. They were all buying off Gordon McPhail. Wow. Um, yeah. And the story starts with them. I was in Scotland because I was the importer for a, a distillery, Glen Grant, and I met an Urquhart, and he said, come along to the warehouse and you can you can pick some casks. Yeah. Um, now, all of us are chomping at the bit at this moment, but you've got to remember, this is the late 70s, early 80s when no, that nobody was there. You know, there was yeah. nothing. So they yeah. were the absolute godfather of... Um, independent bottling in that period caden heads who are possibly the oldest barry brothers may have a claim to be older yep. but caden heads um were in the doldrums around that period it was i think in 1962 that that headley wright bought the company um and didn't do a huge amount with it they were doing these weird bottlings it wasn't really until the 70s they started doing the dumpies and think late 60s 70s and even then you're talking tiny numbers really, yes. really tiny numbers but GNM with a, you know, it's funny how when I started, <laughs> you you couldn't get a pen out of that company. I mean, it, they just wouldn't sell you a thing. But they started all of these independent bottlers. They were selling to everybody, and then as soon as things got good, lockdown, nobody can get anything. Um, yeah, but definitely. So definitely. you don't, you don't. Even when you started, there was already people had witnessed significant changes. Yeah, the changes had already started to fortify. Right, it's just yeah. you know, it's. The yeah. fascinating thing is, and I put this in the book as well, when I started, the, the biggest broker at the time said to me, you have missed the boat. This is in <laughs> 2005. He said, you've missed yeah. the boat. He says, you won't succeed. He said, all the Dallas do's, all the Brewers, all the Port Ellens, they've all gone. You won't get any. He was right. I didn't get, I didn't get any of those, actually. But what he didn't understand was, we, we were living in a world where suddenly to be an independent bottler, you didn't need those. You could bottle a Glen Bergie. You could bottle a Glen Allicky. Let's remember, nobody knew Glen Allicky. You yep. could bottle Ben Rigg. Nobody knew Ben Rigg, you know. So yep. um, he, he misunderstood where the industry was, was heading at that point. But, uh, yeah, I mean, that's 2005, and we've got the biggest broker saying that's the end of independent bottling. So yep. nearly 20 years ago. Incredible. And it's incredible yeah. how... And we always, and I'm sure that, you know, our our discussion and whatever conclusion we draw to tonight, it probably isn't going to age very well, David. But all we can do is we can judge based on where we are today in 2023, right? Sandro over in Italy is saying uh, independent bottlers have and continue to be an affordable source of whisk, whiskey exploration. Newer players will hopefully continue 
the tradition. It's almost a perfect segue. You had, you had almost brought me to a good segue as well. You've already mentioned this idea of Gordon McPhail, and they were responsible for spay malt in Longmorn and uh, Glen Talkers and you know all the distillery labels. They were the they were the brand front line for a lot of these distilleries at some point until that started to change. But I'm going to put a statement up here now and talk about independent ownership. So so gone from Gordon McPhail where they've got these. Uh, you know, huge variety of brands under the independent bottling roof. They have now gone down a route of the Cairn and Ben Romack, for example. Adelphi are at Ardna Merkin. Signatory, I've got Edredour and Edredour 2. And anywhere you look, I mean, obviously Cadden Heads have always had a Springbank down there. They've expanded now to Glengyle. But everywhere you look, the independent bottlers of a significant scale with the muscle in order to become distillers have become distillers and for a while there we saw quite a gulf between an armchair distiller maybe a smaller scale distiller and all these kind of there was a gulf in between and then nothing until the bigger distillers come along and then we saw the growth of north north star spirits when they still started and when they grew that shouldn't have happened it's a bit like you say it shouldn't succeed and yet it does because there is an appetite out there feeding this promiscuity yeah, but how well, much that's a great example. He, uh, North Star is a great example because uh, when did Ian start? He celebrated five years, not that long, a year ago. So he's six years old. So we're talking 2017, 2016, 2017. Yep. And when he and I got together, because he left AD Rattery and, and he and I were good friends, and he said, Look, I'm thinking of doing this. That could have been my time to tell him. As, as the broker told me, you've missed the boat, mate. You, you know, you're yeah. never going to get these great <laughs> piles of this, that, and the other, which I was privy to, you know, that parcel that I talk about in the book that made my company. Mm -hmm. um, I could have told him that. But like um, Andrew Smith at Little Brown Dog and like Phil and Simon at uh, the door at Dornock and – like the guys in Sweden, like Jess. Mark, Mark Watt down in Campbelltown. Mark Watt, yeah. obviously Mark Watt. It goes without saying. All these people, you take them out of the equation. It's like that moment out of Sully. You know, you take Sully out of the equation, that plane crashes. Um, you need yeah. these people who come along, and Ian is a guy who who will come to me with an idea, and I'll go, oh, geez, you know, that's not how I would play it. And he does it his way, and he wins. And, and I, you know, he and I will then share a dram and I'll say, well, you were right and I was wrong. And I tell you, that's happened every three months for the last six years. Um, and Andrew Smith, a little brown dog, he will come along with an idea, even if it's dressing me up in a green suit with a cucumber. And he sells out everything he does. And he doesn't need that much stock because his business model is so ideal and perfect. Um so that the idea that, that these independent bottlers will disappear, there's too much spirit, human spirit, and a human will to survive and persevere. The guys at Woven, another good example. Yep. Yep. You know, you could say to them, God, Compass Box have sewn that up. You guys are never going to succeed. Mm -hmm. Well, we will, and I'm sure they will because they're fantastic guys. Yeah. With regards to the too many brands, well, well, what, 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 what was just just to kind of pick up on this, Sandra's point and the point that you brought it up to there, you know, you mentioned Gordon McPhail having two distilleries now. So I did a VPUB, uh, I don't remember if it was earlier this year or late last year, but if I was to count all the distilleries from the year 2000 until the year 2030 that were in production, that had released product or were in construction or uh, financed and planning permission approved, by 2030, we would have 72 new distilleries in the 21st century in Scotland producing malt alone. Does that include the new Compass Box and the new uh, no. Chivas? No. Is that 74? No. It does not. There's 74. It doesn't include uh, Angus's project at Kai. 75, yeah. yeah. It, it doesn't. It doesn't. There was, there's so many that's come along since. So we're we're probably knocking on 80 now. Now, of course, there will be some, you know, some are going to fall by the wayside. Some might not meet realisation, all of these things. It doesn't matter. It's that's the scale of what we're talking about, and it's not Aaron, as you recalled, where they're going to set up and hopefully sell to the blending companies or whatever. All of these people want to make the best malt whiskey they can make to be sold for malt whiskey's sake. Yeah, well, it's like the old joke that uh, was it. Mark and I, Mark Watt and I, were joking that every tour you do, they all say they bet they get the best casks. Somebody's lying. <laughs> yeah. 
I've not been on the tour yet where they get the average casks. We're, yeah, we're, right. yeah, we're not. We don't want the best. We we get the second. Yeah. 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 No, it's it's incredible. We, we'll we'll be at a situation the industry's never been in before, and what's what what you've got to even factor into that isn't just that there's going to be seventy five six new distilleries. In that period, Glenlivet's gone from three and a half million to twelve million, and uh, Rosal isn't one distillery; it's twelve. And yeah. Kalila now makes as much Isla whiskey as all the other mainstream Isla whiskeys. You know, it uh, begs up all these incredible numbers that we're crunching, um, and we're sitting on over five billion liters worth of stock, which is, yeah. you know, it's it's doubled in thirty years. Yeah, some something's got to give at some point. Either the markets that the industry is relying on to break like the great sluice that they hope it will, either that will happen, or we are going to have another whiskey lock, the fourth or fifth or sixth or seventh or whatever number we'll be at. Um, and it's it's very hard. You know, I'm a passionate guy. I love the industry. I love the people in it. But it's very hard for me to look at it and not think we are headed towards an absolute glut of whiskey, an absolute oversupply. Um, but there are some well, very... I, 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 think, I, I, think, I think, and I, I, want to, I want to continue this discussion about this kind of independence, but also this serving a, a very promiscuous market. But we're also in a situation where, as you quite rightly say, doubled in that, that period of time, more whiskey than there's ever been, but also a more ex it's been more it's more expensive than it's ever been too, despite there being plenty of it these days. And also, we have never seen. I know it's very very fragmented. It's very small scale and granular. But world whiskey, world malt whiskey, and and all forms being at a scale that not only has has grown exponentially, but it's it's come from nothing. Mm. There was nothing, and now there's millions of it. Yeah. And all countries are interested in their domestic product too. Yeah. Do you think this, I, I'm stating here independent ownership, there are too many whiskey brands. You and I are promiscuous, right? I guarantee you that even though there's probably a representation from every region in Scotland and multiple regions across the world on yourself as there is mine, we are super promiscuous. Do you think there is enough of that out there? My concern is that there could be but the industry is not pointed at harvesting that curiosity. They are whiskey's already, and it's always been an expensive hobby, David, but it's no more expensive than it is today. So when we all die, <laughs> are the younger generations just going to live off what leave, we leave behind you and I? <laughs> because they're not able to afford any of the whiskeys that's been yeah. sold to them right now. So yeah. are, are there too many brands? Are there too many brands vying for this space? Is, where are we right now? And I think I have to be careful not to just smash it all together like a big kind of premiumized stuff and high-end stuff, expensive, exclusive, scarce, rare, and then all the kind of new stuff that's coming along where, where for me the real excitement is. Um, are you nervous about the amount of brands that are as well as the amount of volume that is? Yeah, it, it's, it's difficult to keep up with. Um, and it's not even just the number of brands, it's the number of new releases. I remember when new releases were a big deal and you can't keep up with them now. You just cannot. Um, you need the deepest deepest pockets. And it's got to the point, it's funny, I was at, uh, I took my brother who's, who's he's been drinking whiskey a long time, but it's never really seen the industry like me. And we went to the whiskey exchange in London and looked, had a good look around and he came out and he says, it's just mind boggling. He says, I don't know where to start. Yeah. You're intimidating. You are with um, brands. With you know, you look up and there's 30 different Ben Nevises, and if you don't have the level of knowledge of the people who are posting on the right there, of which of whiskey drinkers is only 0.1 percent or something, you know, it is absolutely mind-boggling. And 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 then you look next to the shelf of that, and you've got all the whiskies from Australia. And we're only getting an absolute pinch of the 250 Australian distilleries. And that's before you even yeah. think about America. There are more micro distilleries in America than there are in Europe. You know, it's ridiculous. Yes. It is It is very, very difficult. But it's funny how things move and, and, and shift. When I was 
shipping to the US, the micro distillery in America thing had really just taken off and shops couldn't get enough of it. They were selling out everything they were doing and the market really had just given up on independent bottlers. We're talking sort of 2000, between the years of about 2002 to 2012, 14. Well, right? I remember you writing about this specific weird dynamic in the book. Yeah, I remember it, that. It, the yeah. US market just, independent bottlers suddenly not bothered. But the local Arizona distillery, the local Seattle distillery, the local whatever, can't get enough of it. Taking people to the visit center, we're buying every bottle and they're doing and they're, Prices are increasing, increasing because they're selling out all the time. And then all of a sudden, independent bottlers are back in a big way and people are scrambling for them. Oh, single cast scotch. I'd forgotten about this stuff. It's really interesting. So you had a bit of a backlash. And, and I remember one retailer, one big retailer in the U.S. telling me that he had one of the larger U.S. distilleries saying, look, um, we'll give you a buy one, get one free. I mean, it was unheard of for, for, wow. for whiskey. Because yeah. they couldn't shift it anymore. So people are, well, there's too much of it. I'm not interested. When Suddenly when there's too much, the, the, the FOMO goes and the exclusivity, the limited nature. and Desire so people, is taken well, away, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and, it, and it had caught up in price with independent bottling again. It wasn't $25 a bottle anymore. It was now $100 a bottle. And then you're releasing a 12-year-old scotch that's $80 a bottle. And suddenly people are going, well, this is a no-brainer. This is really interesting stuff. Um, and so independent bottling took off once again. So maybe we'll Incredible. see a bit of these shifts of dynamics. Uh, the other really interesting one, this this is the the biggest growth in, in, in Scotch whiskey in Australia since the Second World War. So despite got, the Tasmanian boom, despite, despite 250 distilleries, the Australian whiskey market is growing year on year. So these homegrown distilleries are feeding the a frenzy yeah yeah well fee and, and also the knowledge and, and of course there's a lot of relationship between scotland and australia a lot of expats that kind of thing so um, well, i think yeah, i think it. ryan sutherland sorry in the chat makes a yeah. point that that's a perfect highlight to what you're talking about ryan sutherland he's a distiller up at eight doors distillery right in the top he says we only make about thirty thousand liters of alcohol a year at the moment so hopefully an oversupply situation wouldn't affect us even more than that what he's going to do is for everybody that comes into the distillery as a potential person that he can turn into an ambassador, not just for Eight Doors Distillery, but for everybody. To, Have you tried whiskey? How amazing whiskey is? And 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 that idea that you don't just drink whiskey. No, no, it's not just yeah. drink. It's not just drink. It, it's actually a ceremony. You sit down and it moves you in a, in a way that 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 I've never understood before. And I think that that you talk you with your anecdote about Australia there despite the explosion that we're seeing and in, in the whiskeys down there, the distilleries down there, that feeding a, a larger appetite for a larger industry, I think is very, very interesting, especially when the, the products that they make become so scarce, so desirable, that even when the prices go up each time, they still sell out. It makes you realize why the other industry bodies look at that and say, well, Premiumization. <laughs> that's that's the way to go, right? I, I'm being deliberately provocative here. I see you smiling, David. It's like we've rehearsed this, Roy. We're just seamlessly going into these banners. <laughs> Can I say to everybody that's joining in, all 320 odd of you that are sitting in here chatting us with us right now, you know the truth. <laughs> we do not rehearse these things, <laughs> but but they but they are things that we talk about and they're things that impact us. You know, we, and the community that's in here tonight hanging out with us, David, we are a, a, a sliver of a very niche digital yeah. consumption of a very niche product uh, interest out there. You know, we, we know that we are we are kind of the right at the jaggy edge of things. Preaching to but the choir, are, as my dad would say. Sorry? Preaching to the choir, as my dad would say. Yeah, yeah. And we know how whiskey moves us. We know that it's, it's a passion. It's, we really do ache and think about these things, and we spend an absolute fortune on this stuff. We really do. And when we recommend it to our friends and our peers and the other people who we feel might be curious enough to try whiskey, we don't take the responsibility lightly. We want them to taste something that lights them up the way that we've experienced. Yeah. So I think it's becoming harder today 
to send them after something that they probably have to chase and have difficulty buying, yeah. or if they do track it down, they have to pay a ridiculous amount of money for it. Yeah. I remember telling a guy in my very whiskey room, he was just round here to quote on some work in the house, and he held a bottle of Lagavulin in 16 in his hands, because that's what I was recommended to him. And he was really excited to try it. It sounded like it was right up his street, and he said, how much is this? And at the time, it was only £60. It's more than that now. But he nearly dropped a bottle. He was panicking. He said, oh, wow. He said, oh, sorry, no, is this a collectible? And I realized I had moved away so far from where I'd started. £60 to me is not a lot to, sp to spend on a bottle of whiskey. But to him, £60 on a bottle of whiskey is unthinkable. Yeah, that's right. We're yeah. in a difficult position right now to yeah. bring those hordes of people in, those curious minds. Yeah. When the whiskey offering that we have, just there's not many creative whiskey companies out there today, David. <laughs> just, there are a lot of them trying, and and I think that's what the Oswiz is about to celebrate those. But what 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 do we say about this premiumization? Everybody's talking to their shareholders about hyper premiumization now. I've heard. Yeah, <laughs> what, yeah, what, no, it's, what, getting, it's getting mad every every year. It's getting worse, but I think. I think the the backlash has already begun on some of that, and it's it's something that that I find more and more and more is that because of this uh, growing group of people who are so passionate about the subject, every distillery and brand and brand owner seems to get more and more. Um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, caught up in their own. Uh, fervor, their own hyperbole, their own marketing, and they're constantly believing what they've got is worth more than what it is. That's that's just a given now. And the whiskey show is a great example. That's one of the reasons I go every year because you get to just touch base with what people are believing about themselves, about prices, about demand. And you know, one you know, ten years ago, I'd go there and the and the first like single cast it a hundred pounds and you're like wow that's ridiculous no one's going to buy that of course it sells out secondary markets 150 quid three months later next year you go we're up to 150 and i think the one that blew me this year was a very understated distillery not much marketing not many people know about it single cast 17 year old 255 pounds and I know the guy who runs the bottling hall for them. And I said to him, does this sell? And he goes, well, no, not really. And I said, well, it's because you've priced it, you know, for 255 pounds, I can go buy an independent bottling 30 year old or something. This is 17 years old. You've caught, you've, you've got carried away with your own belief, yeah. uh, self-belief, you know, um, what the market will stand. Yeah. Yeah. But coupled with that, it's been driven with by certain markets and, you know, before we came on, we very briefly touched on the one of one thing that's going on at the moment. The guys buying that whiskey are, other than companies buying them, which could be happening, these are people who have, who are peacocks. They're not whiskey explorers. This is stuff to show off with. This is stuff that will go on a mantelpiece with. And too much of this whiskey is getting into that category the peacock area, and, you know, I'll be sexist here, the alpha male, look what I've got. I've got a 60-year-old Macal, and it was in a Bond movie, all that kind of thing, and then the price drives up, price drives up, and the undercurrent pulls everything up with it. Oh, well, if they can charge that for that, we can charge that for that. They've got a they've got a pure metal stopper. Well, we'll go for a granite stopper, and the fact the stopper costs £25 means nothing because we're going to charge £400 for the bottle, and it just keeps pulling. Everything just keeps pulling up behind but we don't have enough people in that world to buy everything under your McAllen's, your Glenmorangies, your Dalmores, the companies that have positioned themselves for decades into that world. Um, and I think eventually we'll see a little bit of a stabilization, especially as we've already touched on, there's so much going out there. But it is very frustrating for us, the people here who, as you already said, bring these bottles along to share, to drink, as we see more and more of our money going out for a 10 year old, 11 year old, 12 year old. Yeah. Because these yeah. brands have cottoned on to the fact that if they spread it thin, if they make it exclusive, if they put it in a box, all this kind of stuff. Um, and, Contra and contrived scarcity is not the same as actual scarcity. Yeah. And I think that everybody, everybody will be found out on that. Uh, I know that we said we wouldn't talk about the one of one. 
<laughs> Sorry, I brought it up. <laughs> no, but I, I, I did mention to you, but I have to say I feel it's, and I know I'll be called out on this and I'll back down if I have to, but it's vulgar. If you are supporting a charity, there are better ways to support a charity than to promote absolute unique exclusivity to the richest mm -hmm. of the rich. And and if you if that's your way of promoting a Halo brand, you have not only lost me, you've lost my entire community, the people that are in here hanging out right now. None of us give a crap about the things that we can never even breathe the air of, let alone touch, see, or sip. It's vulgar, and don't use a charity as a cover. It's nonsense. You, you know, might charities me. will will benefit out of what you're doing, but there are other ways to do it that's far more inclusive and would engage us with those charities too. Yeah, the two things Sorry that occurred to me from that were um, firstly the the, the yard bait cast that sold for sixteen million, and they gave one million to Isla. Well, the cast belonged to Isla. Surely, at least half of it should have gone to the island. I mean, they, it's not like LVMH needed six. They'd have been, they'd have, yeah, I mean, it's 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 that argument where okay, so we'd have been better not giving Isla anything. Yeah, no, it was, it was, it's about appropriate behaviour. Yeah, it was dissolved. Just... But the other thing about it was, I would love, and maybe somebody should do this, and who knows, because I'm independent, and I know enough people. It would be fascinating to see an independent bottle as one of one, and see it, and see how they get it right compared to these chiseled polished waxed um designed sculpted blah 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 if we did uh, an independent one of one we would see some of the most hilarious fun and spirited bottlings i think we've ever seen imagine well, a little round dog one of one <laughs> if we talk about fun i'm going to switch back to a comment that was uh, quite a wee while back in the chat i don't even know if i can find it now and it was by sugar kitty asking about you Touched upon it there, some kind of gherkin suit. I've not heard about this. I don't know what that is. The cucumber, the green suit. Uh, is that a real thing? We we I did a bottling with Little Brown Dog of um Cameron Bridge, 30-year-old, and Andrew. Um Andrew and I go way back. And he said, Um, I wanna get you set up in a warehouse with a green screen and you wear a green suit, and we're gonna reenact some famous movie scenes um now i know andrew well but i don't know how well his computer skills are and it turns out he has no computer skills <laughs> so if you google a uh, little brown dog um stirk you'll probably find the video somewhere um okay it's a, it's a complete I'll tell, you, I'll tell you what i'll do i'll go and do it for you and i'll put a link in the description <laughs> to stop you all going off but to be honest <laughs> <I'm doing it. laughs> i get out bad but the poor fella who who i have to ride at one point is Andrew's business partner, Chris. Now he should know better. So um, yeah, Chris. Chris has come out of this much worse than I have because he's yeah. he knows what's happening. I don't. <laughs> anyway, I'm was, super intrigued to go and see it's what it's all fun. about. Super what was intrigued. really bad was with, we did it at the warehouse of Claxton's, which is down the road, and all the staff were walking past, and I'm dressed in a green suit with um, what do they call motion bubbles on me? Of course, nipples. Yes. And else holding a cucumber and all the girls are, are walking past who I, I know all, I know that all the staff and they are killing themselves and I'm trying to stay straight because it's on camera. And, yeah. Um, anyway. Yeah. 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 I've just but got that's the point. point. It, just got the pony up. So in, 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 yeah. <laughs> a one of one from the independent bottlers would be fun. Just fun. Yeah. Anyway. Tongue in cheek fun too. And I, yeah. I guarantee you that if, when it became to, this is how we do it for charity. I know that you would probably do it right as well. Peter Hunt is saying David was stitched up like a kipper later. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. You yeah, can bid on members of the of the community getting stitched up by Andrew Smith. There you go. That, I mean, that, that's better than a bottling straight away. Jimmy Legg is saying, I don't mind paying for quality. That's right, David. I think it's important what Jimmy, the point that Jimmy makes. We are not asking for cheap whiskey. Don't get the things confused. We are happy no. to pay a premium for good quality whiskey. Yeah. But that's what we've been doing for years. What's happening now is beyond that and he's saying it's those who don't know what quality is that get screwed over and unfortunately that's true people tend to have the money to burn too malcolm r is saying so true aquavite regarding the amount of disposable income most people might have to spend on a luxury drink as a retiree i have to consider very carefully before buying a malt you and i both malcolm and i think what we need to remember is that you know we're not really judge if there are people out there with more means than us and they can spend a bit more or be a bit more carefree that's fine it's amazing and they, they can probably prop things up for, for the rest of us and uh, you know it's not all about that but it's about when you are excluded 
And it doesn't ever need to be like that. There's lots yeah. of opportunities for it to be both. Whiskey with Molly Bennett saying, what's David's opinion on cross-marketing, e.g. Bamore and Aston Martin? Let's dwell on this premiumization thing a little bit. We've got Bamore and Aston Martin. We've got McAllen and Bentley. I've never got my head around the drink and drive thing. Come on. It's got yeah. to be a blunder. Yeah. It kind of reminds me when uh, when a local uh, manager asked me to sponsor his kid's football team and I said, I can't mix kids and alcohol. I'm sorry, I'll give you money for kid, but don't put my name on it, please. Yeah, yeah it's weird one that the, the, the whole, it's it goes way, 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 way back. Johnny Walker in Formula One goes way back. Uh, Dunhill yeah. as well. Um, yeah. But... I don't know. I don't. I don't mind these these cross pollination things. And and what somebody said before about paying for quality. I also don't mind the fact that if the Dalmore Constellation series comes out and it's six figures, it, that, that doesn't bother me. The McAllen series come out for such and such. The Johnny Walker, you know, white ghost stag heads landed on a Tuesday. What I don't mind those things, and I don't think most of us do. The premiumization bit that we don't like is when something that really is quite standard comes out. You know, it's the the wolf in sheep's clothing. It's it's the you know we've tarted this thing up to look like something it isn't. That's um, that's when it gets a bit frustrating. And of course, there you know the limited nature of things. If you are hanging on like a couple of companies to the last few casts of Port Ellen, nobody expects you to put those out at the prices you bought them at. We don't mind Port Ellen being four grand a bottle because it it is we so are, limited, rare, and, it, and in one day there will be none. We, yeah, we exactly. understand. We're exactly. wait for the next. And there are things that we can understand, but there are things that we can't. There was a producer out there who this year uh, made a blended whiskey from their biggest blend source and they mixed it with their biggest malt source um a distillery that can be it can be no older than about uh 12 or 14 years old at the most for the malt the blend the the grain component could be much more than that but they made just a thousand bottles when they have billions of liters and they charged a thousand pounds per bottle yes. for this contrived contrived scarcity aspect yeah um, I'm not it's saying that because isn't it? I don't. The only I would normally just tell everybody on the VPUB what exactly the producers, the, the distilleries involved. But I'm just I uh, I'm saving your blushes here. Um, Yippee ki yay! Oh. <laughs> sitting there with I'm, a beer. I'm just asking for what beer I was drinking. But yeah, it's the Ro it's the yeah. Rose Arthur thing, isn't it, Roy? You know, it, it, we've got the we, we've got the 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 absolute you know. Uh, megalodon of distilleries, the one ring to rule them all. Mordor, as the locals have been calling it, massive, massive distillery. First the Azure is Death Star. Star. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> First release, 125 quid. It's 12 years old. Uh, and, and that made me yeah. really sad because I want to understand what the Azure think Rosile is. And the way that they can convey that to me is to bring out their first ever inaugural release from Rosile and share it with us. Now, uh, if, if you look at inaugural releases, there's lots of them out there that have been that price. I understand, I get it. But this is the first time the special releases have had nothing for me to touch. There's been nothing under a hundred pounds, nothing. And the other inaugural releases that have come out, uh, in Sterni came out with a Rylo, which was gorgeous liquid, 105 pounds, 115 pounds. Sorry, I'm out, I'm out. So at 120, 125 for the Rosile, I am also out. And then it becomes a kind of protest statement for me as well, because I really want to try it. I really want yeah. to have the bottle, but I would have to facilitate the, the continual price increases year after year by paying that price now in order to have it. So I'm not doing it. And yeah. there's, and it's well, where do they go when, when sales don't meet demand, you know, the, the, the nearest distillery to me did exactly the same thing. First release was 300 quid. Second release was 130 quid. Third release was 95, you know, and they're still around 69.95, 67.95. I know the distillery you're talking about, and yeah. nobody's talking about them. Mm. Nobody's celebrating yeah. them, and that's that's heartbreaking because yeah. I've been there, and it needs to be celebrated. The story is wonderful. It's just really clumsy positioning. It's like yeah. it's like just they've divorced themselves from the kind of zeitgeist that you could have tapped into and had a bunch of free marketing. Anyway, this brings me to that point mm. that that amazing space has been left that this vacuum has been left at a time with those 72 new distilleries that i was talking about they're coming on stream by the month right now new distilleries 
David, none of them are producing thousand pound bottles at forty percent. They're all Thank producing. God. God. <laughs> yeah, they're all producing. They are at every stage of the process. They're trying to dial in as much flavour as they can. Selective barley mashing, fermentation, fermentation times we've seen it's just ridiculous now. You know, the, the, everybody's kind of this, these because people realise how important that is. Yes, the efficiency is down. It's going to be a bit more expensive, but we want flavour. And the slow distillation, maturation, and the, the and really the best cast that they can afford because they know they're going to have to oftentimes sell it cheap. Sorry, sell it young, yeah, but not cheap. All of these new distilleries are coming in right now. Do you know the problem I think I have? The size of David Stark's shelf and the size of Aquavite's shelf. That they're just, and I've got a big whiskey shelf, but I can't, I can't put all these whiskeys on the shelf, all of them. Yeah. So and even know, and, and even go up a step, the size of Good Spirits, you know, one of my favorite retailers. They yeah. can't accommodate all of them. It's it's impossible. There's too many. How yeah. do you how do you resolve that? How do you if you imagine your story, your anecdote there of taking your friend into the, the whiskey exchange, he his his brain was already fried by established distilleries and the selection that's available there. What's happening in the future is going to need a new way to think, surely. Mm. So we're going to need to adapt quite yeah. a bit. And so what we've got now is we've got this independence thing that's working against us, I think, a wee bit, where everybody's doing their own independent thing in a super enthusiastic and really quite interesting way. Honestly, I'm, I, I want all of it. I can't have all of it. But 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 now we're we're reaching a point that I'm starting to worry a wee bit about the fragmentation the granularity, the saturation of it all. Have you, I know that you don't touch on that a lot in this book, but I know you think about these things. Yeah, no, it, it's it's after the um, prom night, you know, what happens then? You've got your initial release, everybody's super excited. You've you've released, in, in uh, Harris's case, what is it, 12,000 bottles, you've sold them all we're doing so well. We've sold so many of them direct as well. So we've taken the extra margin doing that. We've made so much money. Well, we can do another one, but everyone's got the first one. And funny enough, I think uh, Tor Torre Vague suffered a bit with that. First release came out, absolute sellout. And then the second one, which kind of confused people a bit because they changed what they were doing. And not sure people were all like that excited about it. You know, it, it, it kind of lost a little bit of impetus. Um, and you could pick out examples of that all along the way. The, the one we were speaking about, about before, the nearest one to me. When yes. you don't have age, heritage, established um, routes to market, established customers, all that kind of thing. Um, I think after the initial fervor, what, how do you keep reinventing the wheel? You know, you can't get people back in to buy that first bottle. And it's like we said before with the exploration thing. If I, on my shelf, if I buy a, um, let's see, if I'm, I've got a Lockley sitting right there, I've got one. I don't know how many Lockley releases there have been to date, five, six, whatever there is. I've got five. Yeah, I'm not going to. I don't even. I don't have close to them all. They've got their four yeah. seasonal releases, and then a cast strength, and then their core. So there's at least six core range every year. Yeah, I, I'm. I can't keep up with all of those because I've also got ten North Stars, ten Little Brown, you know, and the Delphies and Arden Americans. So my my buying ability, shelf ability, even my desire to have all of these different expressions is 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 limited, um, and I think. Certain distilleries have, have found that they come out whoosh first thing flies off a shelf fantastic. Well, what, how do how do we how do we maintain that? Um, and I think it's going to be very interesting to 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 see what happens with that. Um, well, I, I, have to, I have to be honest with you, David. There are torchbearers out there for all the industry. I think Springbank has has always been a torchbearer, honestly, and it's only now that it's been hammered home just how much their kind of really independent mindset has has empowered them but we've we've got much newer players on the scene doing a very very good job arna merkin's inaugural release was the same price as their release if you were to go and buy it today it, it's just it's an obvious thing to do because it's the right thing to do it's doing the right thing 
a lot of business folk out there would say, oh, we're leaving money on the table, we're leaving money on the table. No, you're stealing from whiskey's future. You're stealing from your own future. And, and I think that what's wrong with just being fair rather than being opportunistic it's yeah is, is, am i is it my naivety at play here what's i just don't get it yeah i don't understand i don't understand why why people just don't play fair I, yeah i i think it's going back to this they it's caught up in their own fervor that they're, they're in their own little world and they as i say that you can if you're releasing your first release as long as it isn't a million bottles you're going to sell out and you can even you can even do the inch darny thing and charge 115 pounds a bottle likelihood is you're going to sell out your first release first release first release never be repeated again but if you alienate customers and if you and toravegs may be an example of this if you put your best foot forward and you and your second step is not really there that's going to turn off everybody from your third fourth fifth fifth release and i think i don't know how they've been going a few years now and the best thing they've done recently is their batch strength, their, their, their single cast strength, 61%. But it's going to take a lot for people to come back on board, having been disappointed with with subsequent releases. And, f again, for the one down the road, um, when you come out with your big press release, the first release is £300. You ask any, you know, the area I live, the, the county I live in, you ask anybody about that distillery and – like me they'll say it's a great place to have lunch but that's it you know and, that, you, and that's a shame because everyone that steps through the door i know that it's a bit of a lost leader to begin with but to put a fairly priced product in the hands you get people it's just free marketing so you're you are taking a lost leader hit but you're getting people talking about it and this is yeah. crazy and i don't want to blow my own trumpet here because i am just one of a million evangelists out there you're another one david right when we get something that we can not be red faced to talk to our community about we shout about it from the rooftops we love it because we can drink it and enjoy it as well and we can re recommend yeah. it to friends and it's something that we end up all enjoying together yeah and i, I think that, that that is is it's difficult to measure it's quite nebulous we don't know how much of an effect we have with our you know shouting from the rooftops thing but i think it's i think Whiskey's future relies on a hell of a lot more than just a pretty box and an exclusive uh, price tag. And that's maybe what Springbank struggles with more than anything else. They have surplus demand to supply. If they continually raise their prices, they'll turn off demand because people just won't. There's, there's, a, there's always a point. People just won't pay. Um, and they're juggling it fairly well at the moment. We still have far too many buying it and just sticking it straight into auction sites. Not their well, fault. Nothing they can do about it. Um, they can try all they want. Raw Mark can try all the things they want to do. It, it will continue to happen. When you have queues of people waiting for product, they're not waiting because they're going to drink it. They're waiting because they're sticking it straight into auction. Yeah, so yeah. not j &A Mitchell's fault. And it is something that... They, they just will struggle. They could price it out of the flippers chart, but to do that, we'll price it also out of the drinkers. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And, and what we have there is still the, they are challenges, but they are the challenges that a distillery wants to have rather than the challenges of nobody wants to buy our whiskey. Yeah. So if Springbank continue to do what they've done in the past and strike the balance well, they're going to survive and and, and all of these kind of undulations that whiskey is going to throw at them. My concern is more of these people out there that have billions of whiskey to say demand two and three times over, but they're selling it at a price point to pretend that like they're a Daft Mill or a Springbank or a or whatever. This mm. is the first year, and I sense this that tipping point you're talking about where people disengage. I think 2023 is when people disengaged with the Azure special releases because there were usually you look at it and go, oh, it's too expensive, but there's one or two there I can touch. There's one or two there that I'm interested in. That's actually good value. A 20 year old Craig and more a couple of years ago for 120 pounds. I'm in fantastic. 11 year old delicious car do a, a few years ago. These were affordable whiskies in my price range this year. There is nothing for me. And I sense there is nobody in my community talking about these. Mm. The people out there in social media that are talking about them are 
exposing themselves as paid for content, sponsored content. And you have to ask yourself at that point, they are only allowed to give one message. And that's not the message that you want to hear if you're being encouraged to spend nothing below three figures on a bottle of whiskey. Yeah. I, I I think this is the year finally that I, I've just, I, I can't, I just can't anymore. It's not even a question of I choose not to. <laughs> They've made it so that I physically cannot justify yeah. it. <laughs> it's it's funny, buying buy now for a shop, I, I have that three figures in my head and I'm desperate for so much of what we stock to be under three. And then I'm, and then I'm looking at 80 pounds and I'm desperate for so much to be under that 80. And then I'm looking at the 50. Um, and then really I'm looking at the 30. So, you know, if customers come in, if you, if the group of customers come in, 50% will want to spend 30, 30 pounds or yeah. less. And then you've got another, and then it just goes up and up. And of the people who will spend over a hundred pounds on a bottle of, of the footfall of a normal shop, and there are guys on here that can fill these figures in far better than me, but it's probably 3%, 3 to 5% of everyone who comes in. It might even be less. It might be 1% of everybody who comes in is willing to part with a hundred pounds because whilst whiskey prices have gone up exponentially, let's not all kid ourselves on that. Our salaries have matched <laughs> the growth no. of the industry because no. they haven't. Uh, and, and, and worse than that, everything else has become more expensive as well. Especially um, the younger folk that they need to come in once they get to a point in their life, a certain point of maturity where they actually start to taste rather than drink and whiskey's sake, I'm speaking about here. Um, I, I think it's very, the, the lower rungs of the ladder are starting to get too high for them to even step onto. Um, and that's, that's a concern. Thank goodness for the Thompson brothers with their TB BSWs and their SRV fives and Arda Merkin with their McLean's nose and these kind of things, because like that footfall you get in your shop, Mm -hmm. looking for in that 30 pounds ballpark you've suddenly you've got things to put in their hand and and you can look them in the eye and say this is wonderful whiskey yeah it's still possible it's not going to be there forever sure for all of them but it's still possible and there are people out there that despite everything are going to try to give us it and they you and i know who those people are and we're yeah. very grateful to have them there um Sam Zaid is saying 100%, even a 10-year-old Oban is going for 169 euro. Ask Bjorn LP, ask Bjorn, I, I know it's the first time I might have welcomed you in, my friend. He's saying I disengaged with the Azure Special Releases three years ago, basically after Lagavulin and passed £100 in my market. Well, I did too, uh, ask Bjorn, but, but I went back to buy, I uh, spent £120 on, on the last one, um, and it was purely to, to find an alternative and send out his blind challenges to my community. You might have watched that that VPUB and Lagavulin in 12 was beaten by its very, very inexpensive um, neighbor. It's, it's there, it's, you can't continually trade on brand. Your marketing department, they're professionals and they do a fantastic job. But at some point you've got to be able to step up and actually back up the thing that they're selling. And so yeah. many times out there, the liquid is not backing up the, the, the value proposition. Hells would have seen plenty of tourists buying them at Lagavulin yesterday. Hi, well, it'd be interesting to see. Um, that is not where they sell their product, unfortunately, Helen. They need to sell their product through the duty freeze, through the wider market, through everything. And they might still be selling decent there. But I'm telling you now, Helen, I know that they're not because you can still buy previous year's Lagavulin 12 still on the shelf so they are making more i don't i don't understand the strategy p ed is saying i agree with david keep in mind that all of the whiskey the cheap blends still make up more than 90 percent of the market yes you're absolutely right frank but by volume by yeah. value by value that's shrinking year after year after year yeah olga gn is saying uh controversial but really let's uh puts whiskeys by price on the shelf oh yeah well and that's an interesting one. So Olga's suggesting you merchandise your new shop, David, by price point, by price. Like TK Maxx, do it by size or something. You do it by price. I tell you what, do it for a few weeks and see how it works. And see, <laughs> watch where people... Get. Do a time lapse of, of, <laughs> of bottles disappearing and bottles getting dusty. I like that. That's right. And there's nothing worse than being in a shop and not knowing how much something is and having to ask, you know, you, you can't afford it, right? This uh, is the pound shop where nothing's a pound. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Uh, Whiskey with Molly saying Dura is still the best selling malt in Scotland. Absolutely, price point at sale. That's the business. That's the market they've gone after. Daniel Wells is the same. How about Electric Rioca Cast for thirty one fifty? Absolute blinder. We've talked about it in the in the V Pub in the past. Some people didn't really get on with it. Found it a wee bit tannic or something. I love it. And when you look at the value proposition, natural whiskey for thirty one pounds fifty. Yeah. If if Distel or sorry CVH as are known these days can do it, other producers can do it too. Great it's funny how the, how the companies will compete with themselves. Though. It, I find that astonishing that you know White Mackay have Dalmore, where they've positioned it. Um, and let's be frank, Dalmore is not exactly an earth shattering dram ever. They've positioned it at nothing under a hundred quid. And yet they've also have Jura, which is the best selling malt in the UK, because you can walk into any supermarket and see it on special every single week of every single year. So it's incredible that the, the, the same company, and I would put Jura and Dalmore fairly similar in quality. Yes. I'm not a big fan of either, I'll be honest. Uh, and yet one's, and they're both packaged well. Packaging's fine. Not necessarily that big of a difference. Dalmore's 100 quid. Jura's 25 it, just astonishing and to go back to what somebody said about the, the the bulk market when when you think that they could make more money selling that stock to independent bottlers in bulk but prefer not to by selling it to countries like india where they'll add mix so the indians will buy it in what did they i've yes. got the chart here was it 200 million liters last year or whatever it was or 27 million liters of bulk, they could yeah. make more money selling that to gordon mcphail or you know, all these other big bottlers, but they choose not to. That says quite a lot about the industry, that they, they're they more bulk-driven and uh, less caring of, of the, the ambassadors of the industry, the people who, who do the groundwork. Um, I don't know. That's been going on it's, a lot. It's, I mean, it's, it's crazy. I, I am hearing a lot of pa a passion from... Um, and it's absurd you're an Englishman as well, I have to remember. And I mean nothing against the fact that you're... But there is a... There's almost an ex expectation on me as a Scotsman that I should be kind of proud and want to preserve, you know, the legacy of Scotch whiskey and things like that. But you speak passionately about it because you know w the power that it has and you love the history of it. You love everything that it's been able to achieve. I feel that what you point out there, David, is in the hands currently of people that only care about the very short term tenure of their job, three to four to five years ahead. And that's all that they care about. And beyond that, they don't have any concept of the fact that they're supposed to be preserving something for future generations. They are mere yeah. temporary guardians. That there's, is not happening right now. There's a quote in here from, from the great nose, Richard Patterson, in his book, where he talks about their bulk sales to Japan. And he mocks the people who were annoyed at this enormous amount of whiskey that was going to japan and there were mps in the highlands who were bringing this up in in parliament um to say this is outrageous it shouldn't be going on they're taking our product claiming it as their own all this that, and the other and he mocks the people who who are annoyed at this saying it's what the japanese want so of course we should give it to them because it's what they want but you know as much as i love and respect richard patterson i think that's incredibly short-term profiteering when you should be saying, are we not the greatest whiskey in the world? So the, so the, the customer then becomes the expert on the product that you make. Yeah. That, and what happens fallacy, is Japanese whiskey that's, starts winning all the awards. That's the fallacy. The amount of times that you hear that a product exists in a very awkward, clumsy way that betrays the quality of what's made at the distillery um, in a very bad way, actually. It represents, sorry, the quality in a bad way. But it's because the import or the agent or the market demanded it sorry tell the market no they cannot have that that's not yeah. a good thing yeah. you teach them what the right thing is and what it should be and how it's best represented why is this so absurd a concept to understand yeah. our naivety sorry my naivety david shows once more again no doubt i'll be called on it i want to finish off by saying um what about all these companies that are out there and i don't want to just think about the little tiny companies out there like you know phil and simon up there in dornick or whatever i, I want to talk about a whole swathe of kind of quite large scale producers as well who have a mindset of independence, a different way of thinking and a way of taking control of their own destiny, but they're also open to the magic key that unlocks lots of potential and that's collaboration. When, resource, when resources are short, 
when marketing is expensive, when distribution is expensive, when centralised warehousing, when to attend a whiskey show like London at the weekend, all in different booths, all scattered all over the place, is really, really quite fragmented and really quite, and they're all selling a very, very similar message with different shades of the rainbow all woven yeah. in. How, wh what would it take for everybody to get together and say, right, the SWA is not doing the thing, the, the, big, the big corporates, the multinationals are not doing the thing, we need to get together because Scotch whiskey has a much louder voice than all these guys with the really short tenures. How could we get together and empower and then teach people that whiskey is more than just another alcoholic drink? Is there any future in that, do you think? Oh, yeah, definitely. And, it, and it's funny. That, that's how it used to be done. Um, when when the demand wasn't there, when malt whiskey was breaking through, when it when it was just bulk blend driven, if you went and did a trade show in Spain or in Van Expo, one of the first ones I did, you would sat on, you would sit in the stand of the Scottish Enterprise stand, and you would sit side by side with Glen Farkless, with Aaron, uh, not Aaron, um, who else were there at the time? Jeez, can't but remember. It's but it's that, perfect. That long ago. It's, but, <laughs> but that's perfect. That's what you need yeah. to do because you yeah. can't. It was can't Scotch. Watch. That's what it yeah. was. It was brown scotch. It wasn't. It wasn't Diageo. It wasn't Shivers. It was brown scotch. Now they probably had their own stands, but then they were doing wine. So at the time, they probably had Johnny Walker and then Penfold and all the other wines. And Shivers had what have they got? Jacobs Creek, whatever. I don't know what it is, but yeah. all of their wines. Um, and I think now that we're at so many smaller companies, I think you're quite right. It, there needs to be uh, a closer knit community in that regard if you are going to go do a show in japan why don't you you mix together of course a lot of them will have the same importers so that works in that regard if i've been going to holland for 20 years and if you go to the big show at uh, the hague you'll have an importer with 20 independent bottlers side by side all all around all again promoting this importer's products so you do have that kind of collaboration but there should be more. And, and, and Arden and Merkin, I know we love these guys to bits because they are the best. Um, they have, from the off, decided that they would promote other bottlers, other companies, other ways of doing things. And from them, you've got a couple others. Rasse have done one now, I think, with... Did they do Berry Brothers? I know, I know Filey yeah. Bay, my good guys, my good friends down in Yorkshire, yep. they've done very bothered. That sold out in seconds. Couldn't believe it. Uh, I wish I'd bought one. Um, all these little things, it, it brings it to a new audience. And if you want a greater audience, collaborate, work with people, do, do things like this, this kind of collaboration. Let's see. This, this is what the industry needs. <laughs> ah, perfect. <laughs> right. So, listen, there's still uh, 287 of you in right now. Uh, David, has them on you, David has just shown you a picture of uh, an electric queue, which is a an interesting collaboration between Mark Watt, Watt Whiskey, and David Stark. Uh, the electric uh, side of things being obviously Mark Watt. Watt is an electric uh, measurement, obviously. To, um, and Stark is what, a David? Coup. Yeah. A queue. So any barflies that are still in here right now with access to the whiskey-themed emoji, if you support this channel... Show how much you've enjoyed David's candid chat tonight by filling this chat full of the newest emoji, the guest emoji at the end. I'm trying it out for tonight. It might not age well because every time I change the guest emoji, it'll backdate and change all the previous emojis. So it's only going to be effective for tonight. So make it impactful. And I'll light the chat up with the stuck emoji just to say a big thank you to everything that David has shared with us tonight. Look at that. A coos heed just for you, fella. Have you ever had your own emoji before? <laughs> <laughs> That's impactful. That's wonderful, guys. It's just superb. I don't know how attractive the coos heed is at that scale, but it's much nicer when it's blown up a wee bit. But there you go. Um, lots of people really, really appreciative of what you've shared with us tonight, David. And I think it's important because all the people that are in the lounge tonight understand every concept that we've spoken about. They, none, of the, none of the things that we've spoken about is difficult or challenging for them to understand. And every one of them in the chat tonight are ambassadors for another pool of people that scales it up again. They are the ones out there 
They are not the tail wagging the dog, as I've said before. They are the nose of the dog. Yeah. They teach us everything all the time. David, thank you so, so much. Let me ask you, my friend, do you like a quiz? Yes. Well, that's a good thing, <laughs> because obviously we always finish out the VPUB with a quiz. Normally, if there's a guest in, I tend to lean the quiz towards them, so it should be easy for you, the guest to get a pass mark. Please don't ask I me have my, to, wedding, my wedding day, my, my wife's birthday. <laughs> I have to, I'm going to pour another one of your, um, this this fantastic, uh, what I used to think was a can envy, but it's now turned out to be a Balvenie. Um, I'm going to pour another one of these for the quiz at the end, and I'm going to make a confession to you. Because you're David Sturk, and because you have no speciality, because your knowledge is so broad, I've just gone for, with very little concession, a regular quiz at the end, and I think right, you're okay. going to be okay with that, right? There are one or two freebies for you, I hope, so you're not going to go home on a donut, David. <laughs> but it will be a wee bit of a challenging quiz, and I didn't think for a minute that that would uh, put you off for a second. So are you up for it, my friend? Let's go. Let's do it. Can, uh, anybody that wants to stay for the quiz at the end, it always dips at the end. It's a, a Pretty crunchy quiz tonight. The pass mark tonight is definitely five out of ten. Um, there are some crunchy questions in there. Um, I don't even remember what questions I've put together, so let's just go for it. There are always multiple choice. You're only playing against yourself. Remember, only share the score if you want to, and uh, I'll try and call out who's doing well as we go through. Good luck, everyone. Question one. Which of these new distilleries has released, has been released, sorry, which of these new whiskies, sorry, has, has been released in the last few days? Which of these new whiskies have been released in the last few days? I should really check these a wee bit better. Anyway, A, Springbank 12-year-old Palo Cortado, B, Kuboken 15-year-old Oloroso Batch 2, or C, Isle of Harris Single Malt? Roddy has found his own David Sturk emoji. Roddy Graham's in. <laughs> and he's found the standard Q. <laughs> yeah, Rod, Roddy should have his own emoji somewhere. He'll Can all the barflies that are in, mailing. please? Watch this, David. Can all the barflies that are in tonight please light up the chat with the Roddy emoji? <laughs> and just as a tribute to the fact that not only because Roddy's in tonight, but David has asked for it. Roddy has his own emoji, believe it or not. Look at that. <laughs> That's Roddy walking along with a Glen Cairn in his hand and a tie-dye shirt. <laughs> Ponytail, beard, the whole shoot match. Fantastic. So there you go. There is a Roddy emoji. The, <laughs> Did the you know that when you asked that? Sorry? The Bill Bailey of the whiskey world. Exactly, exactly. Oh, he's some guy. He's a superb guy. Yeah, superb. Um, you didn't know that Roddy had an emoji when you asked that, did I you? I did not. I did that. And that's not set up. So there we go. Be careful what you ask for. <laughs> okay, what do you think, David? Who's released in the last few days? Uh, well, I know the Isle of Harris was released in the last few The Herach. So I'm going to go C. Yeah, you would also have been safe if you'd said B for the new Kuboken Batch 2. Uh, both of those have been released in the last few days. We're waiting imminently. I don't, I'm not sure when the Palo Cortado comes out from Springbank. Not that it'll make any difference. I'm very unlikely, unless I just happen to be in Campbelltown <laughs> on the day it comes out. I think I might struggle. Uh, fantastic. Well done, David. Question two. What whiskey? is a relatively small but celebrated independent bottler, and its bright labels display different colours to represent what? What does the what whiskey colours represent? Is it A, different regions, B, flavours, or C, owners? You could have asked what the logo represented as well. I thought about it. I thought about and it. Not, not necessarily what people think it means. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. One of one. Rob Smith still using the David Sturk emoji. <laughs> Use it while it exists. <laughs> uh, I'm limited to the amount of emoji I can have, so I had space for a new emoji tonight, and it was obvious to me what one I was going to make. Um, it was going to make one as a wee, uh, a wee homage to David Sturk. So... <laughs> 
Oh, at least it wasn't the steaming pile of uh... <laughs> <laughs> what comes at the opposite end, right? Yeah. What tell us, David? What does the different it's color? Flavors. It's flavors. Mark, now, mark tasting colors is a name for it, but I can't remember what it is. Synesthesia. Mm, might be. Yeah. It wasn't yeah, that a band. Think... In, wasn't that an all girl band in the nineties? <laughs> Probably. But I think it's a, a some kind of form of that at play. I do also occasionally taste, I don't always taste in colours, but I know some things do taste of a certain colour to me. It's, um, But it's also, it's one of these things that I think mood's part of it. So something that could taste green or red or purple one night may taste a wee bit different another night. But I do vividly have colour experiences from time to time. Question three. Oh, sorry, here's a wee, I, I concluded a wee lineup of all those colours. Don't expect any consistency in the colours, by the way. It's not like SMWS, right? It's just mm -hmm. like he picks a colour that uh, that matches the bottle of whiskey. I think it's quite interesting. And the logo is a taste bud for anybody who cares to know. So, Yes, a taste bud. I should have maybe put that in as a wee to zoom up a bit. It's not some but... weird South American vegetable or something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, you just need to buy yourself a bottle if you can and have a closer look at it. Question Excuse me, question three. If Westport is teaspooned Glenmorangie, what is Ward Head? Ward Head is A, teaspooned Balvenie, B, teaspooned Highland Park, or C, teaspooned Glenfiddich. What is teaspooning, David? Tell us what teaspooning is. Oh, geez. Um, there's a fantastic little brown dog video on how teaspooning happens. And Mark and I always we keep threatening that we're going to go to a whiskey festival with the badge that says official teaspooner. Um, it is supposedly the idea that you add a tiny amount of something else to a malt to blend it, to take away the name of the original malt. So it goes from a single malt to a blended malt. But the idea that these companies are adding tiny amounts to these whiskies is, is nonsense. Um, yes. So it's interesting that some of these come in as single malts. Yes. That's right. The idea that somebody would literally go around cask by cask and add a wee drip in yeah. or, or even tip a bottle into the vat or something. Yeah. 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 In, in fact, if you read if you read the book, there's a very funny story about um, uh, Williamson. Not funny, interesting. There's an interesting yes. story about Williamson. Yeah, ah, yes, I remember it now. Williamson, yes. Lefroy, teaspoon Lefroy. Yes. Or let's, let's say the trade name for Lefroy. Yeah. 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 So everybody's kind of got this right, I think, David, tell us. C, Glenfiddich. Yes, uh, Ward Head is Glenfiddich. And uh, I believe what I have in uh, is in my glass tonight is Burnside. Yes, that's right, yes. Teaspoon Balvenie. Highland Park is Whitlaw. But it isn't. That's single malt. So um, I don't think there is a teaspoon Highland Park. Okay, Whitlaw's trade name for Highland Park. Yeah. Good stuff. Question four. Three out of three for you so far, David. Which of these top six distilleries is the only one not to increase its market share in the last five years by volume? So we're looking for one of the top six, the big brands, not to have increased its market share in the last five years by volume. Is it A, Glenfiddich, B, Glenmorangie, or C, McAllen? Not increased is the thing here. Mm. Gerhard Grasbock is saying one out of three, to be honest. Gerhard, thank you so much for your honesty. Thank you for being a barfly. And thank you. It might be the first time I've mentioned your name tonight. Thank you for your honesty. Rick Johnson on a two out of three. He's already slipped a lot along with Too Slow Rob, Donald Pass Whiskey. However, on three out of three, along with Steve Atkiss, Rod Graham. Roddy's on a three out of three as well. I think the chat should play against Roddy tonight. See how we got on. What do you think about this one? Well, I could cheat and get that out, but um, <laughs> uh, I don't actually know this. I, I'm going to guess not increased its volume. I'm going to guess Glenfiddich. It's interesting because it weaves directly into and makes perfect sense after the discussion that we've just had. But the reason I added by volume in there, it is McAllen because yeah. they are selling less at a higher price. Okay. So the other guys are doing a wee bit of that, but they're still managing to grow their volume, their, their nine-liter cases that they're selling. McAllen is selling less volume 
for a higher price and making more whiskey than they've ever made in their life. Mm. It cannot, it doesn't make sense to a, a simpleton like me. But that's what they're doing, and uh, they're doing very well at it. And, uh, you know, the Robertson Trust are doing well out of it too, so it's, I suppose it's not all bad. Greg's Whiskey Guide is uh, on a three out of four. Good to see you, Greg. Oh, my goodness, says Pedro on a two out of four. I knew it would be a crunchy quiz tonight, guys. Hang with it. Eric Cunliffe down in Campbelltown is on a four out of four. Hey, it's a good time for you, Eric. Well done. Four out of four. For, oh, sorry. It's a slip. It's a wee banana skin there for David. So he's on three out of four. Um, it's good to know that the great and good are a wee bit fallible from time to time as well, David. Question five is always a picture. Mm. We're going to look at a distillery. I'm not going to ask you where it is. I'm not going to ask you what it is. I'm going to ask you which distillery it is. What are we looking at there? Are I'm assuming Graham Fraser's excluded from this part of the quiz. <laughs> he is absolutely always excluded. Graham can only ever score out a nine, or he can take his own freebie because he deserves it for the amount of amazing pictures he provides me with and take a wee extra point towards his 10 out of 10. I think it's the least we can do. Are we looking at A, Glenn Dullin? I saw you look tips. Are you leaning forward? Good yeah. man, good man. There's a, there's a clue on the picture. <laughs> yeah, you can see Glenn, can't you? Is it A, Glenn Dullin, B, Glenn Talkers, or C, Glenn Ord? <laughs> there is a wee clue. Graham occasionally leaves wee clues in there. Sometimes I blank them out and sometimes I leave them if they're subtle. You, you might have really good uh, Photoshop skills and um, just added that in. Nope, nope, nope. That's uh, that's untouched by my, my uh, any photoshopping this time, as far as I'm aware, at least. We're looking at Glenn Dullin in Dufton, Glenn Talkers, uh, owned by Pernod Ricard up there in Speyside, Glenn Ord in the Highlands. Would you be guessing this one, David? No, there's too many trees for Glen Ord. And the two pagodas, um, it's a bit of a giveaway, but I'm pretty sure that's Glen Talkers. Might be Spot wrong. on. Fantastic Thanks. deduction. Well done. And you're right, you can see that there's a wee G-L-E-N in the back, so I had yeah. to make sure that all the possibilities tonight would be Glenn's. <laughs> B, well done. Might get crunchier still on the way in. You need this for your pass mark and then you can relax. Which of these numbers is the greatest? The number of A, Shiva's own distilleries outside of Speyside. B, the number of operational pot stills at Glengoyne, or C, the number of Scotch malt distilleries beginning with F. Which of those is the greatest number? Some of you might already consider this a bit of an ass hat very early on in the night, but Black Fen, Steve Atkiss, Mark Watt. Mark is in tonight and he's on a five out of five. He's saying, I've passed. Your buddy's beating you, David. Pressure's <laughs> on. Pressure's on. Where's Roy? Roy of Emir on a five out of five. Fantastic. Five out of five for Dave Barnes, Peter Box, Whiskey with Molly Ben, Daniel Williams, Philip Wagner. Hell's Wind on a five out of five, celebrating, relaxing. You've stayed up till the end, Helen, as well. Superb. So good to have you. Uh, I thought you'd lo I'd lose you tonight after your binge in uh, Brooklandy's Warehouse on Isla today. Very knowledgeable crowd, David, right? Mm. What are you going for? Jeez, I don't know. I, everyone here is saying C, but Scotch Malt's the series beginning with F. That's a toughie. It's too late for me, but I'm going to go B, just for the hell of it. Knocks it out of the park. <laughs> well done. Falkirk and Fettercairn. Yeah, I didn't think the there only, were many. Yeah, and the only Pernod Ricard on the Mark. Now, I've already said it, Mark. You're too late. You can't just come in afterwards. No wonder you're <laughs> five out of five. <laughs> <laughs> Falling account. Uh, what's the only Pernod Ricard distillery not in Speyside? Uh, malt distillery, Scapa. Yes, Scapa. Yeah. Well, until they build their supposed Isla distillery, which is another Scapa. weird one, right? That's every bit as weird as the Gordon McPhail announcement. Anyway, question seven: Dura remains the biggest single malt sold in the UK. It's already been pointed out by the chat tonight. But who has second place? Who's second to Dura in the UK? This is a bit of a horrible question for everybody that's out there in the big wide whiskey world, and I do apologise. Um, it's going to be tricky, but, you know, 
It's one of the biggies. A, Glenn Fittick. B, Glenn Mornji. Or C, Glenn Murray. Who comes in second to Dura? Pete Head is saying one out of six. Oh my, Frank, you have never. Legfest is still commanding its toll. <laughs> uh, demanding it's told yeah i think you you need some rest and recuperation frank my goodness i've never seen that black fan sold a pup by the crowd <laughs> he's complaining he slipped a five out of six <laughs> if you follow the crowd such is the threat of a banana skin as rob smith is pointing out p ed is saying okay i'll just take the point <laughs> <laughs> what, do you, what do you say david what's number two to jura i think it's i think it's got to be glenn Fury. I'm orangey in Scotland, but I think Glenn Fiddick in the UK. But I could be wrong. Spot on. Absolutely. According to the brand new, just out this week, you must enjoy this wee book as well, David, right? It, yes, absolutely. All of them except that one, which is arriving tomorrow. This, I mean, it's already fantastic. It's just, it's the smell of a, a new book as well. I love it. But this I is get that. a review at the beginning of the independent bottling uh, section. So I'm looking forward to seeing that. Oh, that's that's extra special content. This was delivered at Landed this week. I've Love got it. a brand new friend. I've got just, this is just, I know I'm going to buy so many copies of these. Give them away like I always do. I've got one in my bag, one in my bedside, one down here all the time. It's just, it's like a pal and whiskey. Um, absolutely love it. Absolutely love it. In fact, I'm going to tell you the only book to have touched uh, my reading hours more than a malt whiskey yearbook is this book, is your book this year. Thank you. I've gone through this twice, and I need to go through it again. David, it's an absolute masterpiece for whiskey botherers, whiskey geeks, and everything. And like I say, do not consider that book only about independent bottlings. Anyway, question eight. Which of these nominations for the best Scotch whiskey in the 2023 Online Scotch Whiskey Awards comes from the oldest distillery? A, Port Charlotte 10 year old comes from the oldest distillery. B, Benromac Cast Strength comes from the oldest distillery. Or C, Bunahavan Cast Strength comes from uh, the oldest distillery. Are you aware of the online Sc Scotch Whiskey Awards, David? Yeah, I've been to, I went to one of the, um... oh, wait, hang on a minute. No, no the Oswes are fully online. Yeah, no, 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 no. I know it, but uh, no. Um, yeah. yeah. That's, That's the um... one I went to. The, the, the... The, the great yeah. Glasgow one where everybody gets dressed up and uh... oh yeah 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 no it's um 65 online commentators on whiskey um also retailers bloggers podcasters uh, real world people behind bars and things like that all get together to nominate six whiskies in nine categories and put it out for public vote uh, that's on in the background right now. I'll send you a wee link, my friend, because I think you might be interested in the concept. Uh, it's a fully, fully grassroots, fully independent, fully enthusiast driven as well. But what I'm asking you here is out of, there's three out of the six nominations in the best Scotch whiskey category there, all attainable, affordable, good quality whiskies. I hope you agree. Mm hmm and um, I'm asking you which of those is from the oldest distillery. Going to go with C. Going to go with C. Mm. The crowd is also going with C. Port Charlotte's made it by Gladi. Mm -hmm. Ben Romack, of course. Been a have and C is 1881. Ben Romack is 1898. Port Charlotte is also 1881. Ah, trick question. There we go. Trick laddie. Now, I'm to be honest, Hold on, Rob. if I did want to be pedantic about it, I think that Bunahaven didn't get actually producing whiskey until 1883, whereas uh, uh, Brook Laddie managed it in 1881, 1882. So it could be that actually they could claim being a wee bit older, but to all intents and purposes, they're both 1881. So A and C is both, are both correct answers tonight. So well done, holding it together. Seven out of eight, David, superb. Second from last, which distillery was the first to receive a royal warrant? A, Royal Loch Nagar, B, Laphroaig, or C, Royal Brackla? Tends to get crunchy towards the end. I don't know if you know that what the asshat question is. The number 10 is deliberately designed to be an awkward, really horrible question. So this is your best chance to secure an 8 out of 10 minimum. 
Whiskey Novice Jim is saying five out of eight. I'll claim the pass and go because my battery's about to cope. Co co <laughs> night night. Jim, it was so great to have your company at the weekend, buddy. I can't wait to see you in November again. Rod Graham is saying, is this the opposite of an ass hat? Exactly. It's a dead, straightforward, simple, clean cut question. Was the first distillery to, re to receive a royal warrant? David. I am going to go with Brackler. Roddy is in here, one of the three members of the Royal Brackler Appreciation Society. <laughs> and this is, it's perfect that he's here, and I hope he answered C for that one. He did. I can see Rod Graham has answered C. Royal Brackler was the first distillery in 1835 by William IV, I believe, the, and then a few years later, Victoria uh, renewed the warrant. I reckon when when whoever gives the royal bit when they snuff it it should be that's it gone gone so wiped out and has to be alive. has to be reinstated again yeah there you go. so that you can get a new distillery to you know it should be a, an evolving thing shouldn't have exactly. it for life not like that yeah royal so then you would have what like royal springbank <laughs> exactly exactly yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> Fantastic. Hurry up, Roy Aquaviti, battery at 5%. You must be on a good score, <laughs> Dave Barnes. Um, okay, this is the ass hat at the end, everyone. I'm just trying to see who's on a 9 out of 9, if there are any. Mark Watt is on 9 out of 9. You're up against oh, it, buddy. Wow. Philip Wagner on 9 out of 9. But Mark Watt's, I I'm not going to suggest he would follow the crowd. I just know he wouldn't. Shoot Sugar <laughs> Kitty's on a 9 out of 9. Peter Box on 9 out of 9, along with Whiskey with Molly. 9 out of 9's, come on, he's saying. Fantastic. There's going to be a potential for a few 10 out of 10s tonight. Let's keep our fingers crossed. It's been a while since that happened. Here's the ass at the end. How many Scotch malt distilleries feature in the 2024 malt whiskey yearbook? Is it about the same as A, the number of pounds you would need to buy yourself a Benromac 21-year-old today? B, the number of miles you would have to drive from Deanston to Klein Leash? Or C, the number the SMWS uses for its Ardnamurchan bottlings? How many distilleries, Scotch malt distilleries, feature in 2024's Malt Whiskey Yearbook? Pounds to buy a bin Romac 21, miles to drive from Deanston to Klein Leash, or the number that Ardnamurchan is bottled under at SMWS? Can you see why it's known as an asshat question, right? You have to know the answer to two things. It's deliberately obtuse and awkward as well. I, th I suppose with A, it depends where you're buying it from. <laughs> and B, are you, are you flying as the crow flies? Are you taking a boat? Are you driving? Is it a leisurely drive? Are you sightseeing? Are you stopping? At I will clarify. A, <laughs> and let me tell you the distance between A, B, and C are such that you won't confuse it. So if you got a cheap source for your Benromac 21, or if you paid retail for your Benromac 21, it would be much the same. Miles to drive from Deanston to Klein Leash. So you have, that's a Google Maps measurement. So straight. Yep. Okay. Yep. And, and C is, is straightforward. Yeah, I don't, right? I don't so. know. They, well, all seem like, they all seem like the right answer to me. Yes. Yes. So you are just throwing a dart, big guy. I have to be honest. Yeah, yeah. you really are. 100 and... Da, 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 da. I like B. I'm going to go for B. I like that. It's probably miles more. to drive yeah. from Deanston to Klein Leash. Yeah. A lot of people going for C. A lot of people like the 149 for Arda Markian. Miles from, to drive from Deanston to Klein Leash is 197. Oh, that's too many then. Oh, I've got that wrong. Oh, that's Pounds. Pound. Ben Romack, 139 distilleries. Yes. 197 miles. Dear me. Yeah. 149 is for Arda Markian. 139 is the answer I was looking for good, there. Good question. Hey, David, you've managed. You only slipped up on two. Would that be right? Eight out of ten. Eight out of ten. Now, that's a celebration. That's an absolute celebration. <laughs> Falsgraf is saying, no effing idea, but the crowd says C. Jimmy Jass went, went with A and he got it right. Superb total guess, Black Ben on C. Now I'm going to be looking for who got the ten out of tens. The asshat's going to have stripped uh, a lot of people um, of the opportunity to do that. I'd, I am sure of that. Let's have a look. <laughs> Samuel Smith is saying, woohoo, I got five. He's mm. celebrating his pass mark. Well done, Samuel. Superb. Take it to the bank, my friend. 
I can't see any tens, David. I can't see any of the. I'm looking for Mark Watt as well. He might be a I nine. Know. He got a nine. He slipped up. He slipped up. Um, but still, but nine at ten is brilliant. Rodri, I'm just saying you a dancer. I don't know what that means, Roddy, but <laughs> tell us. Roddy's saying six out of ten. So he's celebrating his pass mark. That's what it is. The ass mark was wild, says Aspion. It's good to have you in, buddy. Uh, thank you for participating. I think I've managed to catch everybody out. Oh, incredible. And quite rightly, uh, Olga is suggesting that the right answer next year will be 149 for Arden Merkin because of the amount of distilleries, right? Sandra and is also saying, the price for Ben Romick 21 next year as well, yeah, probably. Yeah, unfortunately, you're not wrong. <laughs> well, I passed, says Olga. Sorry, well, I passed, says Sandro Fazzolari. Five out of ten and thoroughly enjoyed Aquaviti, this V-Pub. Where is David's shop opening? Tell us about your shop, David. I know we've left it a wee bit late, but Sturt Brothers. Yes, yeah. Uh, it's in the village I live in, Thornhill, and we're opening on the 20th. Um, and we're stocking just a few IBs, really. That's all we're doing. The idea is to eventually move down into England somewhere at some point. But, um, uh, yeah, it's been, it's been difficult. <laughs> it's been emotional. <laughs> Passion projects are never easy, buddy. No, no, not at all. And everything I do in this industry is a passion project. So how far from the M74 is Thornhill? How much of a detour is it? Uh, about half an hour. Right. 25 so minutes. if you're offering a cup of tea at Sturt Brothers in Thornhill, you're going to get a lot of people saying, right, today I'm going to make the detour. and I'm not going to head my way down to Gretna Services. I'm going to take a cup of tea at, at yeah. Sturt Brothers at Thornhill. Yeah. Uh, and I'll we pick up... absolutely nice guarantee you we will always have something you have never seen before and cannot buy anywhere else. Ga that's a guarantee. Fantastic. Fantastic. Eric Cunliffe is saying, another great quiz with another wonderful guest. Thank you, David. Whiskey with Molly is saying, uh, thanks, David. He's one of us. Thanks, Ben. <laughs> thanks to you. Pete Edison. And I'm calling it a day. Thank you, as always, for organising Aquavidian. Thanks to David for being a great guest and all of you. Slanchova. Fantastic. Uh, James Morgan is saying, would you check with Wild Mail Whiskey to let us purchase your Ardmarkin without password protection soon? Um, James, get in touch with me. Send me a direct message uh, and I'll help you out with that. Hellswood is saying, sorry to go off theme. One or two people asking if they're Davide gone or General Reese yet. As I mentioned earlier, Helen, uh, they're just holding back a wee bit more than they normally would just because of how far around the globe this is travelling and they're worried about breakages and they don't want to see anybody disappointed. Uh, I suspect that there will still be a few bottles left available once they are settled. There's, there are no breakages. Um, Danny Keen is saying, thanks, Agravite, and David has been a great V-pub. Rick Johnson, yeah, light up the chat with the Sturk emoji one more time to say thanks to David. Rick Johnson has done so, and he's saying, another fantastic V-pub, an informative discussion with David. Thanks for making us all a wee bit smarter, Slancha. Thank you to you, Rick. Des is saying, great guest, great V-pub. Whiskey Marcos is saying, thanks, and David, great V-pub. Wind Whiskey and Wine Trails, Tom is saying, great show, Aquaviti and David. And if there is ever a David Sturk lookalike contest, I think I'll be entering. Ah, I get that, Tom. Oh, the, I get uh, that. the Baldy Beatty crew, right? Eh? Yeah, yeah, that's right. And Olga saying, great V-pub as always. Thank you, David. Thank you, Olga, for being in. And you can see uh, everybody. Chris Pollack is saying, thank you, David, for a very interesting V-pub. Fab V-pub this evening, says Helen. Thanks to David. Catch you in the next one from Keswick. And Pedro is saying, another great guest, another great quiz. Thanks, Aquaviti and David. And as a wee thank you, they're lighting up the chat with the stuck emoji. It might not be around forever, my friend, but thank <laughs> you. Can I raise this gla glass of delicious... Sadly missed Creative Whiskey Company <laughs> whiskey and say thank you to you for your honesty, your directness, your passion, your knowledge, your willing to share, your everything. David, there are loads of people in whiskey that I am very, very glad that they are in whiskey and you're most definitely one of them. Can't wait to the next time we can raise a glass together, but thanks for stepping behind the V-Pub. In the meantime, my friend, Best of luck with everything that happens with David Sturk Enterprises in the future, especially Sturk Brothers down in Thornhill. Thank Slash you very much. Cheers. Thank you. Please stay till the credits roll, my friend, if you are if you have the time. And uh, I will raise a wee glass uh, post-stream. But thank you for participating, David. Thank you. I don't know about you. I enjoyed that. I enjoyed that a lot. And I always feel like I'm skiving a wee bit when we have a guest on that's clearly got the knowledge just to carry the VPUB from start to finish. I could just set him up with a camera and a mic and I could sit back and have a few more drums and not have to do much except for press start and stop and things like that. That's the sense I hope you all got from David tonight. It's the sense I got from him when I travelled from the airport uh, to Limburg Festival earlier in the year. 
I think that the things that we had to share tonight only scratched the surface, if I'm honest. I hope they were cohesive, and I hope they made a lot of sense to you out there. Honestly, what I actually honestly think and hope is that there's somebody out there in the industry who gives a crap and who's willing to not listen and follow, but at least take what we discussed tonight as a wee bit of feedback, because I don't know how much of that is going on. I know in the smaller independent companies, I know the ones that are run by impassioned people, there's a lot of awareness. But my worry is that the people in charge of the bigger ships in whiskey right now are all heading towards a wee bit of trouble. I don't understand what's happening. Anyway, I'll leave it at that for now. <laughs> I'll raise this glass and I'll say thank you all once more for joining me for another Thursday night. I can't wait for next week. But in the meantime, I'll raise this wee glass and remind you all that you're very dearly loved. Till next week, slide your barflies. Thank you.